but at the time you have no idea. And honestly, you know, if, if uh, I often tell people if I'd grown up in LA, I'd have probably gotten into film. If I'd grown up in New York, I'd have probably gotten into traditional publishing. But because I grew up in Southern Wisconsin at the time that role-playing games were being born, uh, that's what I fell into, right? I just happened to fall in with the wrong crowd, so to speak. You know? <laughs> and uh, they, they took me off in terrible places and we did horrible things to monsters together. So we had a, we had a great time, you know? And that, that I think was the main thing is, uh, Hey friends, I've been a bad boy and I've allowed the backlog of interviews uh, for this show to expand uh, out of control. Uh, This is an excellent talk with Matt Forbeck and it was recorded way back in last fall. I hate that it took this long to get to the top of the release queue, but boy, is it worth the wait. Matt is a legend in the industry and he is as personable and as knowledgeable as anyone could hope. I was fascinated by his origin story, including a hard right turn that he took in college. Hearing his career path is also a walk down the origin of role-playing games. It was cool to hear about his time in England working with Games Workshop, and you'll never guess what game got him his first Origins Award. He does a great job explaining how his new game feels like a Marvel game, not some generic RPG. And I learned a lot about his approach to playtesting, including the big decision to publish and sell the playtest rules for the Marvel game. All right, sit back, relax, and enjoy my time with Matt. This is Quentin Smith, and when I'm not frowning over a board game manual, you'll find me listening to Tabletop Talk. Howdy friends, Craig here. Today I'm joined by Matt Forbeck. Matt is an award-winning New York Times best-selling author and game designer with, with over 35 novels and countless games published. His projects have won a Peabody Award, a Scribe Award, and numerous Ennies and Origin Awards. He is also the president of the Diana Jones Award Foundation, which celebrates excellence in gaming. His latest work includes the Marvel Multiverse Role-Playing Game, Hard West 2, Warhammer 40,000 Tacticus, Minecraft Legends, Return of the Piglins, and the Shotguns and Sorcery 5e source books based on his novels. He's the father of five, including a set of quadruplets. Matt, that is a hell of an intro. Welcome to the third floor. It makes me tired just hearing it, Craig. (laughs) (laughs) So, Matt, we were talking before we started recording. I just, uh, uh, and I hope that um, people listening, your name has come up so often um, as I've been interviewing creators, you know, for the last three Three years. So I've, I've really been looking forward to this, but I do have to subject you to the question you have answered a million times on a million podcasts. And that is at one point in your life, you knew nothing about tabletop gaming. You knew nothing about grabbing a sheet of paper, rolling dice and pretending to be somebody else. And then it was put in front of you for the first time. Can we go back to when that happened? Sure. Uh, if you're talking about uh, tabletop gaming in the sense of like role playing games and that kind of thing, or even earlier, I mean, like chess. Sure. Um, I actually just wrote an article about this, an essay about this for, uh, there's a new book coming out from Aconite, which does licensed tie-in novels for lots of different gaming companies. And it's run by my old buddy, Mark Gascon. He used to run the Black Library and then uh, Angry Robot oh, wow. after that. But uh, they're doing a, a book called What Board Games Mean to Me? And they asked me for an essay on it. And my essay uh, essentially covered uh, a moment when I was six years old and I was, I was, I was a terrible asthmatic. I was, uh, often in the hospital, like, you know, two, three, four times a week getting shot up with adrenaline so I could breathe. Wow. Um, and you know, because of that, you know, this is back in the days before phones and video games, even or anything <laughs> like that. So, uh, I was reading a lot, I was reading a lot of comic books and other books, but I was in this oxygen tent because they put me uh, in the hospital. I had uh, uh, pneumonia and they put me in the hospital for two weeks to recover from this. And in the oxygen tent, like the condensation just, you know, warped everything I read. And I was like, ah, you know. Um, so one Sunday I'm in there and I was raised Catholic and our uh, family priest, who was a friend of the family, comes in. He's a younger associate uh, who, you know, used to come over and watch Marquette University basketball games with my father. So nice. She, uh, he comes in and Father Steve uh, gives me last rites, actually, at six years old, right? Um, now, last rites... You know, most people, including a lot of Catholics, misunderstand what they are. It's not like, oh, you're dying here. We have to make sure you're in the clear. Uh, and that's part of it. But it's really called the uh, the sacrament of extreme unction. And unction just means you know, blessing you and putting oil on your forehead with the sign of the cross, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. So the priest 
stops, gives me last rites, explains to me. I go, you know, is this it, Father? And, you know, in my little six year old voice. And uh, yeah, uh, he goes, no, 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 no. This is you know, just just in case, you know, we think things are going well, but this is like extra prayers for you to, to pull through. And then he pull. Uh, I'm like, OK, sure. And then he pulls out a, a chess board and teaches me no how to kidding. play chess for the first time in my life at six years old. Uh, and I'm able to, I have to actually lift up the edge of the oxygen tent so I can reach the pieces. Uh, but I, that was the first time I remember playing a game like that. And, you know, I think actually the chess board more than the last rites helped me realize that I probably wasn't going to die because you know, <laughs> who teaches a kid a complex game just to throw out <laughs> death's door, right? It showed his optimism, didn't it? Right. Yeah, exactly. He's like, well, this is going to be a game you'll learn for a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing it wasn't checkers. It would have made you less optimistic. Yeah, I was like, oh, no. Oh, no. It's tic tac toe. I'm doing. <laughs> um, so I was, you know, I was, that's the first time I actually remember playing board games. I'm sure I played like, you know, War and Go Fish and whatever before that, you know, different card games. But, um, and then you fast forward like till I'm like 12 or 13. And a friend of mine across the street, uh, Pat Trudgeon, and his brother Mike was actually in my grade. But Pat, his mother got him Dungeons and Dragons, the Blue Book edition, uh, oh, yeah. Holmes edition, as they call yep. it. That uh, she picked up at Kmart on a blue light special, right? Like, what's this cheap thing? <laughs> I just have been wandering <laughs> through. And it uh, looks good. I'll give it to the kids and see what they come up with. And, uh, she gave it to him for Christmas, and then we were just, you know, not, you know, school's going on. We were playing basketball and stuff, and uh, we didn't actually start it until that summer. And then we just sat down and played it once, and man, we didn't know what the hell we were doing at all. It's sure, just, just awful how <laughs> we mangled the rules. But the fun part is, we had the greatest time, right? Yeah, I think we murdered a party like every session, right? We just <laughs> nobody ever succeeded or survived. I had a. I, my character was a cleric. He was holy man. And I think I was up to like holy man 16 at the end of it. You know, uh, the son of the son or the brother, of the brother, whatever. We're just going <laughs> like crazy. Um, and we just, you know, that summer we played that game like every day for, you know, weeks on end. Um, and then, you know, we go out and play, you know, baseball and whatever else too. We had a good time. Um, but that really hooked me. Right. And I grew up in Southern Wisconsin, which is uh, a little town called Beloit. It's about, 40 minute drive from Lake Geneva, where Dungeons and Dragons was originated, where it was first published. And because of that, I was able to go to gaming conventions when I was very young, right? So uh, my first gaming convention was a winter fantasy that TSR held and was at the American Legion Hall in Lake Geneva, which is a site of a former uh, early Gen Con. And I think I went to that in like 1981, 82. Wow. And I was like 13 years old. And then, um, uh, met Gary Gygax and, you know, my mom embarrassed the hell out of me. <laughs> um, she took me to the, to the convention and she's like, I'm like, oh, I'm playing these games. I'm having a great time. And she's like, I was just talking to this man over here about how poorly oh, no. run this convention is. I go to other conventions and this, you know, and <laughs> sure, by any professional standards, I'm sure a gaming convention in the 80s was not very well, oh, run. that's amazing. Um, and I'm like, Mom, who are you talking to? Oh, my God, that's Gary Gygax. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, we we rolled out of there. And, uh, you know, I ended up uh, going to lots of different. I went to my first Gen Con that summer in 82. Wow. And uh, I've been going ever since. So this last year, I think it was my 42nd year in a row. Uh, just yeah, 42nd Gen Con in a row. Uh, if, skipping the pandemic, actually. But, you know, we're counting as an sure. but. So a couple questions for you, if I could, Matt, real sure. quick. I can um, blather forever, as you might notice. Oh, and I'm, and we're not done with you blathering. That, no, that's that's, okay. that's good. more of that to come. So, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, it, when we talk about our gamer origin stories and, you know, 12 year old Matt may have not known why you devoted an entire summer to this and then, you know, found the gaming conventions. And then we know how the story reaches to till now. But as an adult looking back, Matt, do you have a sense of what happened that summer? So what, how did this blue book and your friends and everybody get such hooks into you that it really changed the trajectory uh, of much of your life? Looking back on it now. Yeah. Do you have a sense of that? It's yeah, it's, it's kind of a strange thing. It's uh, it's one of those things where you look at back and you can, you could plot out the path and say, okay, obviously this led here. Right. But at the time you have no idea. And honestly, you know, if, if uh, I often tell people, if I'd grown up in 
LA had probably gotten into film. I've grown up in New York, had probably gotten into traditional publishing. But because I grew up in Southern Wisconsin at the time that role playing games were being born, uh, that's what I fell into, right? I just happened to fall in with the wrong crowd, so to speak. You know? <laughs> and uh, they they took me off in terrible places, and we did horrible things to monsters together. So we had a but we had a great time, you know. And that that I think was the main thing is uh, it was something to do with my friends, but it was also a time when I was trying to stretch some creative muscles. I was mm-hmm. trying to learn how to do that kind of stuff. I just uh, posted on Facebook the other day. I found a paper I re- wrote when I was in seventh grade, so about that age, right? I was twelve. Yeah, and it was a uh, a history of Marvel's Golden Age comics, right? So I was big into comics then too, and I was, you know, wanting to tell stories and D and D and role playing games in general really give you a way to scratch that itch, right? right. Uh, if you look at most of the people writing in Hollywood nowadays, whether they're writing for film, television, you know, even video games, whatever, most of them have played role playing games at some point or another. Because again, when you're young and you're looking for ways to figure out how to do that, it's a great way to scratch that itch and to, you know figure out where you want to go and how you want to do things and test new things out. And man, it really, it did change my life in a lot of ways. I mean, I'd have done something else. Who the hell knows what, but, um, you know, I, at one point I was studying to be an engineer when I was in college, computer science guy. Right. And, yeah. Uh, thankfully I, I managed to ditch out. Of that <laughs> <quickly> <laughs> so, uh, There's no future in that computer thing anyway. No, so that was no, a good no, move. That's terrible. <laughs> yeah, nobody's ever going to, I was a huge, uh, huge nerd. I mean, I loved all that stuff yeah. as a kid and, I mean, I went to summer science geek camp where I learned how to program and uh, and learned physics and all sorts of wacky stuff. And, and when I was in college, I was in a dual degree program to get a uh, uh, electrical engineering, computer science degree, and a creative writing degree. Interesting. Uh, in yeah. five years, one from each college, from um, uh, College of Science and the College of uh, Literature, uh, LSNA, Literature, Science, and Arts, and the College of Engineering, so the two different colleges. Had the deans of both colleges sign off on it. Um, and then I realized, my dad calls this my quarter life crisis. But I realized that uh, when I was, if I did what I was going to, I was planning to do, and I got the electrical engineering computer science degree, that I would then take a job in that field and I would do something that would probably pay me well and be very challenging and all that stuff, but I would not do the writing. I would not do the game design right. and all the other stuff I wanted to do because uh, that would probably take up most of my energy. Right. And I could tell myself that I would write in the evenings and on weekends, but I also knew that I, I like to play games and see my girlfriend and drink beer and all this kind of stuff. And the chances of me actually pulling that off are pretty small. Um, I've been pretty disciplined on doing creative stuff throughout my life, but I, I thought that was going to be too much of a challenge. So since I was young and, and poor and you know, already living on ramen, essentially, I figured, what the hell? So I dropped out of the engineering college and got my creative writing degree in three years. And then just basically took off as freelancing ever since then. So it worked out pretty well for me. When you, you start, like a lot of us started with D&D, and we think about the trajectory of the games that we played, right? Um, were there other big games for you? So Dungeons and Dragons was at the beginning. When you look back on it, what were some other games that just had a huge impact on you? Man, we played everything we could get our hands on. Right? I, remember, <laughs> I remember playing Traveler, uh, Boot Hill. Was, uh, the first convention game I ever played was at that American Legion Hall in the Winter Fantasy. It was Boot Hill. And the guy running the game was a guy named Steve Winter, who worked in the second edition. And then Steve was a longtime designer and writer at TSR and the Wizards of the Coast. And uh, he wrote the first, he and Jeff Grubb wrote the first edition of the Marvel role playing uh, for, for TSR. And then Many years later, Steve ended up being the first editor I had for fiction. No I was kidding. Doing novels for TSR at the time, or then it got sold to Wizards while we were in the middle of doing that. Um, so, you know, those relationships you start out early on like that because you're willing to try new things uh, really did pan out for me. But we would play anything. There was a game called uh, Crime Fighters that was in like issue 45 of Dragon. It was like 16 pages. We're like, we're playing this, right? And, <laughs> <laughs> we played squad leader and all, you know, anything we could get our hands on, you know, um, just because we were hungry for it. And it was hard to find back then, right? It wasn't yeah. like you just go online and look up where things were. We had a place that was selling D&D in our hometown. It was essentially a head shop, right? And just there was a, a section of, uh, of gaming and uh, weird comics and underground stuff in the back on a magazine rack. And we were able to go there and find it. I mean, we didn't have dice when I started, right? We actually, the first, uh, uh, the, we actually had to use chits instead of Interesting. dice. So you had to like you had a, a sheet with twenty numbers on it. 
and you would dump those into a cup and you had to draw the number out at random. And that was your die roll, right? Because you couldn't <laughs> find D20s anywhere. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, we would play anything. I mean, that was one of the great things, especially you started going to conventions. You're like, oh, there's a whole world out here. It's not just, that's not just tabletop games. I mean, it's not just role playing games. I mean, I played uh, Dawn Patrol in the first uh, Gen Con I went to, and I actually ended up playing with. Mike Carr, who designed the game, who's the only guy who's ever been to every Gen Con in a row, period. Um, no kidding. To state. And, um, and a guy named Marty Stever, who ended up going to college a couple years ahead of me and then uh, being a sales manager at WizKids. And Will Niebling, who was the first vice president at TSR. Wow. Who then ended up mentoring me into the gaming industry when I was in college, right? Um, and again, it's just because you're out there trying new things and you know having a good time and being a decent person, hopefully, as you're yeah. playing. Uh, it really did open a lot of doors for me, right? And again, it was just growing up in the in southern Wisconsin. I used to take off after soccer practice to go up and play test games with a group of guys who formed a company called uh, Pace Setter. Pace Setter did Chill and Star oh, Race and God, Time Chill. And, uh, they were all XTSR guys, and so I don't think I, I realized off, that. Yeah, I would get off soccer practice and drive up there and play <laughs> test new games with them like every Tuesday or Wednesday or something like that. And that's something senior in, in high school. So it was just fun. Right. I want to now veer off if we could a little bit, man, I want to talk about you writing, right? So not writing game rules, not writing games, but writing uh, not only fiction, but nonfiction as well. It, it's now you hinted that you were writing for TSR to become wizards was that the foray into becoming a professional writer? Did that happen through gaming or parallel to it? When did you start going? I think I like to write. Oh, I always liked to write. <laughs> I mean, that was like great school well, stuff. I, 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 let me rephrase that. When did I like to get paid to write? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, uh, I, the first time I ever won something for writing, I was in fourth grade and I, uh, I got an, a, a candy bar for writing a parody of Star Wars called Food Wars. And it was like three pages. I'm like, ooh, you can do stuff. People give you things. And I was just saying, um, right now on, on uh, eBay, somebody's selling a bunch of stuff from Gary Gygax's estate, right? Um, because they found a will that uh, hadn't been found until 2019, several years after he died. And it was finally declared to be legitimate. So now the family is liquidating a lot of his old stuff. Wow. Uh, one of the things in there was a polyhedron number nine. Polyhedron was the uh, uh, the official newsletter of the Role Playing Gamers Association, which was kind of like the Adventurers Guild nowadays, right? Right. And that was my first published work. I actually submitted something to the Top Secret Gadget Contest. Nice. And it was just like this little rebreather device that I think I probably was riffing off something I'd seen in a Batman comic book. And uh, they, I got first runner up, and I was like, oh, oh and like, what do I get for that? I get a year subscription. Woohoo, you know? And, yeah. Um, but I'm like, wow, I at 14 years old or 13 or whatever I was, I got my first little publication. I think that kind of hooked me. Um, so I, I, when I went into college, I really wasn't thinking too much about doing game design. I was thinking about doing writing, like novels and such. And um, I got my creative writing degree thinking that was going to be the way to go. But, you know, trying to uh, line up agents and write novels and, and do all this stuff seemed like a lot of work. And when you're hungry, uh, you're like, well, I have all these game design companies that are, I can work with that are, uh, are already willing to talk to me because I've been working in booths with them uh, through my, my entire college career, thanks to Will Neal yeah. who introduced me to all these guys. I used to be a demo uh, weasel or booth weasel or demo monkey, as they used to call us. We'd just sit there and teach people how to play games. And, um, you know, that got me into doing that. So I, I started doing that when I was fresh out of college. I actually uh, took a flying leap and uh, went to go work for Games Workshop in England. Right. I, uh, no kidding. It's a bit of an involved story, but I had a I wanted to go to Europe. I didn't have any money. Uh, my parents had just said, hey, you're out of college. You're on your own, which is, you know, fair. <laughs> they got me that. Far. That's fair. Yep. Um, they're allowed. <laughs> exactly. And my dad bought me a one way ticket to England as my graduation present because I wanted to go there. Uh, I actually wanted to go visit a friend of mine. The only person I knew in the entire hemisphere was this kid I'd gone to high school with in Spain. and. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, there was no work. There was no work visa program for Spain. There was no student ex right. uh, exchange program. So I went to the closest country of which I spoke the language, which happened to be England. And I show up one Wednesday and I call up Games Workshop. I'm like, "Hey guys, you know, I actually applied for a job through White Dwarf about six months ago, and I got a reply saying you couldn't hire me because I was American." 
and I didn't have a visa. I'm like, hey, I've got a visa. <laughs> you know, it's only good for six months, but hey, can I come in and talk to you? And believe yeah. it or not, they, they brought me in. They said, you know, I toured around the entire place. I was wearing a suit and they laughed their asses off. <laughs> um, they gave me a, uh, at the end of it, they gave me an editing test and said, you know, uh, take this, come back the next, like on Monday, and this was a Friday, and uh, we'll tell you how you do. And so I go off and take the editing test. And this is back in the days when we had to do marking up with red pencils because it was all done literally cut and paste on blue lines and yeah. crazy stuff like that. And uh, I showed up the next day and I said, guys, you either have to give me a job today or my dad's best friend's boss's daughter, I'm told, will give me a couch to surf on in Oxford for a few weeks while I find a bartending job. And they hired me, right? And No kidding. Uh, I ended up working there for six months. I worked on uh, Deathwing and Gene Stealer, which were uh, expansions for Space Hulk. Um, yep. Gene Stealer actually got me my first Origins Award, which I didn't even know about until years later. But, um, <laughs> you know, like Somebody's like, oh, you know, you, that one in Origins where I'm like, really? I want that. <laughs> um, and uh, then after six months, they offered me a full-time job, and you know, permanently, and yeah. said, can you stick around? I'm like, well, let me check. And I called my girlfriend uh, at $3 a minute as it was back in the day, uh, to call back in Ann Arbor. And she said, well, if you're going to stay there permanently, we should probably break up because, you know, that's that's a lot. And I've got another couple of years of college left at least, you know, not including grad school. And I said, well, I can always find another job. So I said, guys, here's my notice. I'm going to leave. I came back on Valentine's Day, 1990. And that's now my wife of 31 years and the mother of my five Get children. out. So, yeah. No <laughs> kidding. Yeah, oh, what a great well. story. Well, so quick question about the Games Workshop thing, because that's, yeah. that's also an incredible story. The, the ending was the finale, though. Yeah, so I give you credit. You should you should look into the storytelling thing, Matt. You're good at it. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's pretty remarkable for you to kind of like, hey, you said, no, can I come in? You come in in a suit. Uh, you know, they give you the tour and then they hire you. Do you, did you get a sense over that six months? What, what made them think like, yeah, let's, let's invest in this kid, right? Well, let's, let's take a shot and let's, let's hire him. Did you get a sense of why they made that decision? I think partly it's because I was, I, I found out years later, I was actually interviewing against two other people at the time, which I didn't know. Yeah. Right? I just thought I'd just walked in with a great moment. Uh, I think probably because I had done some writing and editing when I was in college, I'd done some stuff for Mayfair games. And I had actually worked for New Infinities, which was Gary Gygax's uh, second company after TSR. And I had edited some stuff for them. So I think that probably helped me. What, am I, the guy who was the president of New Infinities at the time was a guy named Don Turnbull, who had run TSR UK back in the day. So probably the fact I was able to say I had worked with Don and done some of this stuff. Um, right. But booted me to the top of that, that line, so to speak. Right. And that was even though they knew that I might only be a short timer. Right. So, and they, they paid me nothing. Right? I, was making, <laughs> I was making so little money. It was like 7,000 pounds a year or something really amazing. Like that. Um, and, uh, but I was, they paid me overtime to play test games. And so I was, you know, I would work up 25 extra hours a week because I, I didn't know anybody there. He had no money. What the hell am I going to do? Sure. Um, and I ended up living, uh, finding a place to live. The first month I was there, or first two weeks I was there, I lived with Simon Forrest, who was the managing editor. You know, let me stay in a spare bedroom. Um, and I found a place to live because uh, with a guy named William King, Bill King, who's one of my best friends in life. And Bill went on to be a best selling novelist and uh, he writes for, uh, you know, not, he wrote Felix and Gottrick for, War, uh, for Warhammer. He writes uh, yeah. World of Warcraft novels, all sorts of stuff. But uh, and he's this gigantic Scotsman and I'm the American. <laughs> and uh, we came in and our landlord's like, oh, a couple of foreigners, sure. <laughs> Uh, but we had the best time. We just had the greatest time together. It was so much fun. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I, uh, I have a lot of stories to tell about that period of time. It, you know, even though it was only <laughs> about six months, it was a very formative time in my life. You know, teaching, I bet. teaching the guys at Games Workshop how to drink tequila, you know, things like that. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't very popular in England back in 1989. So we had a, we had I a can time. imagine. So, the easy question, Matt, is, you know, when did you first become a professional game designer and when did you become a, a professional writer? And the reason that's an easy question is because when I got paid, right, that's the yeah, answer to that cool. question. But what I think is a more interesting question is when did it feel like 
the first time you were a professional game designer. So when you look back, when did you go like, oh, wow, like I'm a professional? Yeah, I don't know if I have done that yet. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. You know, I, That's fair. I, I still do this for fun more than money. I mean, I, I, I mean, I'd make a decent living. And obviously, I've been paying my bills for 35 years or whatever doing it. But, um, you know, if you if you're doing writing or game design for money, you're probably doing the, for the wrong reasons, right? There are a lot of easier ways to make money. If you want to make money going to banking, you know, there's all sorts of ways to to make yourself rich. If you want to do it to fulfill that creative need that you have, then it's a great place to be. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, I don't do it for the money. I try to negotiate good deals for myself, but it's really because I enjoy doing it. Um, yeah. But, you know, I think, let's see, the first time I got a a paycheck. I think the first professional thing I ever did is I wrote the rules for a game called Myth Fortunes that came out from Mayfair Games. And this is like back in 1988. Uh, and Will Nabling and a guy named John Devant- Danovich, who was another friend of ours, uh, came up with the rules for this game, uh, designed the game. And it was based on Robert Lynn Aspirin's funny fantasy novels, the Myth Fortunes series, right? Which I had been a big fan of in high school. So I'm like, that's really cool. Uh, and they and Will and John both said, you know, we designed this game, but we don't really, we're not good at writing. So uh, we're going to hire you to actually write the rules. And I'm like, oh, this is a whole different skill set. Holy crow, I can do this. Yeah. Um, and actually, I kind of wedged my way into doing game design by selling myself as an editor first, because there weren't as many people interested in doing editing as there were people in doing design. And mm-hmm. I kind of wormed my way into doing design and writing from there. Um, the first projects I did with TSR for instance, uh, were editing projects, right? I edited, uh, I think it was Age of Heroes, and <laughs> I edited a Lankmar supplement that Wes Nicholson had written, Wes Nicholson. Um, and then a book came in called Chronomancer for second edition that Lauren Coleman had written, and it had been, he'd written it for Mayfair Games, then Mayfair had settled a lawsuit with TSR that involved TSR buying the entire line. And so they bought that and they said, well, this is okay, but we think it needs some more work. Would you be willing to step in and, and polish this up? So I did that. They gave me a development credit on that one. And after that, they just started hiring me to write. And I'm like, okay, well, this is what I've been working towards. So it's, it's okay for me. Yeah. To enjoy this, you know? um, I, can, I still do some editing every now and then, but mostly for friends and family as opposed to professionally because I much more prefer to be doing the creative stuff. Right When I was running yep. Pinnacle Entertainment Group, um, I was basically an editor or developer there the entire time, uh, with the exception of like the last year. And that was because I ne- we needed those kind of skills to get the games off the ground. Um, but as soon as I could, I went back to creating and freelancing and such as mm-hmm. opposed to running a company, which is a lot less fun, believe me. <laughs> I bet. Is there, is there a f- game, when you look back on it, that you consider kind of the first game that was yours? Huh. That's a good question. Um, 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 I don't know. I mean, I've got a lot of them I consider to be mine, mine, mine. But right, um, like the first role playing game I did entirely on my own was a game called Brave New World, which was a super a dy- super uh, game set in a dystopian uh, present day. So that one's definitely mine, like from top to bottom, me doing all the design and all the writing and even the layout and art direction so that one wow. felt distinctly mine um i did everything in that book except draw because I'm, <laughs> I'm not that good of an artist i could draw okay but you know i thought people deserve better than stick figures in the book <laughs> right so i uh so i hired other people to do that um but there were probably things i did before that where i felt pretty strongly about you know ownership of them i remember that's that was clearly the one where I'm like, yeah, this is me all the way. And I wasn't doing it based on somebody else's game, right? right. Like a lot of times I would do stuff like I'm doing an expansion or a supplement, or if you're writing a book for Dungeons and Dragons, you're working on somebody else's game that somebody else has done. That was probably the first one where I said, Yeah, this is mine entirely. And um yeah. I got the rights to that back a few years ago. I'm actually hoping to do something with it at some oh, point. Oh, nice. But then I started working on this Marvel game, so I thought I shouldn't be working on these super <laughs> games. Might, might keep you a little busy. Um, so, Matt, if I were to go uh, on eBay and track down first edition of Brave New World, and, and I put it down on my desk, start flipping through it and reading sure. the rules and going, well, this is all Matt. Then I grab the Marvel game I just got uh, about two weeks ago in the mail and flip through that. Um, obviously, not the same designer. Right. From Brave New World to well, your most yeah. some of your most recent work. But I bet I could find stuff 
that connects it. And so I'd be, I'd be curious to know if I were to put them side to side, what, what would I see in common? How would I figure out without looking at the credits that this was that th- that this is Matt and this is Matt too? Is there something that really hasn't changed that much that has been consistent all these years? Yeah, I think the tone more than anything else, my, uh, the, the voice, right? And I used to think I didn't have a voice as a writer because my, my yeah. ambition as a writer is always to be so clear about what you're reading that you don't remember that you're reading, right? Um, and if a lot of people like to do like, oh, here's a clever tw- turn of phrase or here's something poetic or whatever. And I never want you to, I, I don't want people to stop and say, oh, that was great. But that jars right. you out of the experience of the information going in your head, right? Yeah. So I always try to be really smooth like that. I think you'll get the same kind of tone in both books. Um, but I was co-writing a novel with Jeff Grubb, uh, who again, was one of the guys who wrote Marvel, the original Marvel Super Heroes game. Uh, we were writing a novel based on Guild Wars 2. And uh, Jeff got brought in because he was the lore master and was working in house and the game was still in <laughs> development. I couldn't catch up. Right. Um, and Jeff did a draft of it. And I went through and I said, no, 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 you're writing it all wrong. I'm like, wait a minute. Oh, that's just because you're not, you're not writing it like me. Oh, geez. I need right. All back on that. Um, so I think, I think you've recognized the tone and the voice. I think that some of the basic ideas behind it, like, uh, Let's try to make this simple and easy for people to grasp. That's definitely something that uh, goes in both games. Brave New World is a much simpler game than uh, than the Marvel game, uh, and it was intended to be. That that was a game where uh, the publisher, which was Pinnacle, started to fall mm-hmm. apart right about the time the game came out, like about a month afterwards. And I'm like, well, I guess that big launch of the comic book stores isn't happening this time around. Um, and fortunately, this time around, we got, you know, it's Marvel publishing. And so big launch into comic book stores kind of comes as a gift. It's nice and easy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think you'd, you'd notice that. I think uh, they both use D6s. I guess that's about that. <laughs> That's a good, good, simple answer to yeah, that. I mean, uh, and that's, again, because we're trying to keep it simple for people who are, right. you know, in both cases, I was trying to keep it simple for people who maybe would say, where the hell am I going to find something that's got 20 sides on, right? And not yep. have to come up with a couple full of chits or whatever. Um, you know, go go raid your Yahtzee box and you're ready to play. Um, so that was one of the ambitions there. I think in both cases, you get that kind of thing. Yeah, a wide gate, right? Which I which I think, um, especially, you know, in both cases where you're looking at potentially a lot a, by the nature, and we're going to get obviously spend a lot of time talking about multiverse, but by its nature, it could be the first game for for a lot of people because because of that so that makes a ton of sense so guys the insider inside series allows me to sit down with designers developers artists writers and creators and learn how they approach their work i try and understand their process inspiration and the methods for crafting their creations we've got a lot more to talk about with matt we're going to take a quick break when we get back from that we're going to talk about something that really has piqued my interest and that's shotguns and sorcery we'll be right back Most of you listeners know how much I love the horror game Shiver and everything else coming from the brothers over at Parable Games. They are friends of the show and they are shaking things up. At the time this episode drops, they have eight new games on Kickstarter bundled together for Zine Quest. One is a new system called All Aboard, an OSR-style rule set for playing stories where characters are linked together by a vessel. This powers the What Lurks trilogy, each one of which focuses on a different vehicle and setting. There's a social deduction game called Someone in the Tavern is a Fucking Mimic. They've also got Squeeze, a game full of subterranean terror with spiky stalactite D4s, a tongue-in-cheek haunted house game, and a house generator. There's Scrappy Slimes, Slimes acting as dungeon crash test dummies, all powered by incompetence, and Christmas Crisis, a quick one-page festive RPG to save Christmas. I'm a patron of theirs, and these are the games we've received as rewards, and I can't wait to get them in print. Check out the Kickstarter using the link in the show notes. So, guys, you know, it um, obviously, uh, you know, I've mentioned I've wanted to get Matt on the show for a long time now, and uh, I have to make a bit of a confession. I probably knew 20% of what you've been involved in. As I started to put things together and research you coming on, I was just, oh, and he did this? 
And he did that. And he did that. There was stuff that I was familiar with that I didn't realize that you were involved in. And there was stuff that I had never really encountered before. And one of the things that really caught my eye was uh, shotguns and sorcery. So I'm going to give yeah. a quick little brief for the audience so they get an understanding of, of, of the book and kind of the tone of things. And then I want to dive into it a little bit. So this comes from book one. Hard times have come to Dragon City. Retired adventurer Max Gibson has seen better times. Things have slid downhill since he and his treasure hunting friends struck it big and called it quits a decade back. It's hard enough to scrape by in a sprawling mountain city in which elves and dwarves live higher than humans in every way. It's worse at night when the groans of the zombies laying an internal siege to the city provide a ceaseless reminder that the Dragon Emperor himself is the only thing that keeps the hordes of hungry dead from storming the walls. When Max is called to help investigate the wholesale slaughter of a long dead dwarf friend's family, he thinks maybe he's finally hit bottom. Then the love of his life, the elf who left him when their careers as adventurers ended, walks back through his door, desperate for his help and with nowhere else to turn. It's not getting any easier. That's for sure. That's a great blurb and a great hook. <laughs> So, I like that idea. I should write that book. Holy <laughs> <God>. <laughs> <laughs> Great adventure seed for you. <laughs> so let's pretend that I take my nine-year-old daughter tomorrow to the uh, Matt Forback Museum. And I take her to the section, the section of the museum devoted to shotguns and sorcery. Sure, and sure. we go to the first installment in, in, the, in the showcase, which shows where the acorn was, where the first little idea that you couldn't let go of was born. Can we go back to the very beginning of, of Shotguns and Sorcery? Yeah. I mean, I think the first time I started, I was coming up with ideas for uh, Wizards of the Coast at a world hunt back in like 2000, 2001. Uh, and they were asked people to turn in like one page pitches for different world settings, right? Uh, the one that won it was Eberron, which is by my buddy Keith Baker, right? Uh, Keith's and I been on, yeah. I ended up uh, writing the uh, trilogy of novels uh, alongside Keith. He did one trilogy. I did another trilogy uh, when the game launched, and uh, we basically swapped off months. So Wow. Um, and so when I was coming up with ideas for that, I had seen, I think there's this game called Arcanum, where I'd seen a, like a shotgun-toting dwarf, and I'm like, Oh, that's cool. And I looked at the game closer. I'm like, no, that's not what I want. So <laughs> what, what I want is what I thought it was going to be. So let's go with that. Um, yeah. So I, I, I pitched it to Wizards with the rest of the world. And, you know, they, uh, it didn't make it because there was like 10,000 of them. And Keith made it. More power to him. Uh, I love Everett. I actually had a lot of fun writing and stuff. With that. Um, but then I'm like, well, I got this idea I want to do something with. So I turned around and I shopped it around. And eventually I sold it to Mongoose Publishing. I, li I licensed to them as a D20 setting back in like mm -hmm. 2001. And I remember sitting down with them at, at Gen Con and having a beer and a burger and, you know, getting all the details hammered out and what we're going to do and how the line was going to go. And uh, it was going to be really neat because I was going to license them the property and then write it for them too. Right. So yeah. they, uh, I would not at the end of the day own everything, which I'm like, well, that's what I want to do. This would be my. And then in November, December, I guess, well, in January, we found out that my wife was pregnant with quadruplets. And, <laughs> and I'm like, well, I don't have time for this now. <laughs> I would love to do this. I, I contacted Matthew Sprang over at Mongoose. I said, Matt, I'm sorry, but this is just not going to happen. Um, and he said, sure, I understand. It's okay. So he let me off the hook. Uh, and then that basically just sat in a drawer for like, 10 years, something like wow. that. Wow. I don't even remember. Uh, well, those are crazy years. I barely remember those years. Sleep deprivation will do a lot to your memory, right? <laughs> um, you know, destroy it in a lot of cases. <laughs> and uh, so Robin Laws asked me for a short story for a collection he was doing called The New Hero, which was a couple of different anthologies he did, volume one and two, uh, trying to explore this idea that he had about what he called an iconic hero, right? And um, often we talk about, uh, in fiction, we talk about dramatic hero, somebody that goes through an experience that changes them, right? right. And that's really the whole point of the story is to see what happens to them under, under pressure, what they will do and how they will change and you know improve or devolve or whatever. Uh, but Robin pointed out that a lot of actually mostly serial fiction doesn't work that way. You know, Batman doesn't change, right? After Very true. Story and everything else, Spider-Man doesn't change. 
Sherlock Holmes doesn't change, right? They are essentially who they are. So his theory was that these characters, um, instead of changing themselves, remain true to themselves by changing the world around them. Interesting. That was the premise, right? To take the uh, come up with a character that kind of did the same thing, but was something that we owned or I owned, Mm -hmm. whoever every every writer had to do this. So I I, uh, wrote the first shotguns and sorcery story, which was called Friends Like These. And it's set in a speakeasy on Dragon Mountain. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be fun. And I had a ball with it. Um, and it came out in the New Hero Volume 2. And then Steve Sullivan asked me for another story from an Origins Anthology, Origins Writers Anthology. And I did one there. And um, and then I eventually ended up doing uh, novels and novellas and role-playing games and everything else. But that was where it really came from. It was that original idea that then Robin asked me to do something with. I'm like, oh, I got this thing i should do fiction for and i had started writing fiction since then when i in 2001 when i had originally pitched it, i hadn't written any novels yet huh. uh, so well nothing published <laughs> at least so, um <laughs> and so i didn't start writing novels or getting novels published like 2003 2004 something like that and in those days i was focusing pretty heavily on fiction so it's not surprising that instead of you know, dusting it off and making a uh, fourth edition setting for it or fifth edition setting i thought oh i should take this into fiction out. When I talk to writers, um, Matt, I've always find it interesting, like you have this idea, right? Which obviously you did with, with, with the, with this book, you had a setting, uh, this idea of an iconic hero that was kind of hammered out as part of, uh, you know, fulfilling that, um, story for Robin. But once you start writing, once you start getting into the characters, start living in the world and 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 sharing that world uh, through your writing, I hear that things change, that the original concept morphs over time. And I, I would wonder if you have a sense of of what happened once you actually went from this is just a neat idea to actually really starting to, to flesh it out and write it. What what changed? I often tell people that writing is an act of discovery just as much as for the writer as it is for the reader, right? Yeah. Um, for, that's one of the reasons I write things the way I do. I have a very, uh, I have a, a pattern I use for writing novels and other things that I've used that doesn't fail me very often, and I, I like doing it, but it basically involves uh, coming up with a very thin, brief outline, like two sentences per chapter for a novel. And, you know, basically I can plot it. I'm like, well, it's a hundred thousand words. I got about 2,500 words per chapter. That means I need about 40 chapters. I'll probably overwrite some of them. So let me figure out 30, 35 different chapters. Right. I'll put in two sentences for each bit so I can plot it out. And then I go. Right. And the, the reason I do it that way is I know there are some people who like to outline. I had a friend who used to write like 20,000 word outlines for an 80,000 word book. Um, the reason that people who like to fly by the seat of their pants, as they say, pantsers, whatever, just right off the top of their head, the reason they do that is because outlining sucks all the fun out of it, right? Because <laughs> if you already know what's going to happen, then it's just like, oh, I just have to color in the numbers. And now it's drudgery right. as opposed to the exciting part. Um, and the reason that people like to outline is because if you don't have an outline, uh, it's kind of like wandering around the woods and hoping you're going to find something right They're like well yeah this is great but is there a through line here does this actually mean anything is there a plot that's going to happen um so for me doing a very thin outline like that or a very light outline means that i have a, a general idea where i want to go uh, i think i know how i'm going to get there and i'm because i've not put too much work in it i'm willing to destroy it at moment's notice right <laughs> right um my first novel i wrote my first uh fantasy novel adult fantasy novel i wrote was for wizards of the coast it was uh mark for death and it was for the everon stuff i talked about earlier and i got about third of the way through the first novel as i was going and i I wrote this really good scene where the the antagonist the big bad guy is facing off against a, a undead elf vampire or something or other sorcerer who's who basically just he's being lippy to her and she just takes him and destroys him just murders him on the spot and i'm like man that was a great scene i'm like oh my god i just killed off my bad guy what the hell am i gonna do now but what i was what i did is i said you know what i'm gonna trust my gut on this one and i said that's what happened so boom i'm gonna keep that and i'm gonna re-outline the book from here wow and i did that i think four or five times in that book nowadays i don't have to do that as often because i know a bit more about where I'm going and how I do these things and how my subconscious works when it's coming up with stuff. 
And, uh, but then I was like, you know, I'm going to trust my instincts here. Uh, if I think this is more fun, it's probably because it is. And I just wrote it. I'm excited about it. Uh, instead of trying to hew to this, uh, this outline that, you know, sure, my editor already approved the outline, but if I stick to that, it's not going to be as much fun. He'll like this, thing, right? right? Uh, let's hope, right? And he did. <laughs> <laughs> that helped. Um, but, you know, that's uh, really, it's, it's about, uh, as you're writing, you're discovering what the story is about and who the characters are and everything else. Writing a second or third novel becomes easier because you already know who the characters are at that point, right? But it, when you start a book, it, you have this platonic idea of what it's going to be and how awesome it's going to be, right? And then as you write it down, you're like, no, oh, it's just crap I'm throwing against the walls. And now I need to, <laughs> you know, form this into something so it's not just slouching over there on its way to Bethlehem, as they would say. But it's, uh, you know, it's one of the most fun things to do. I love doing it and yeah. I don't, I try not to fight it and I've come up with a system that allows me to enjoy those steps of it. And I really think that's one of my secrets of being able to do this for over the long term is I know a lot of writers struggle with it and they actually don't enjoy the writing process. And I'm like, yep. man, if you don't enjoy the writing process, that's a lot of misery you put yourself through so that you could get to the end of having written a novel. Right. Um, and part of the problem then is that once you're done with the novel, how that novel does, how that game does, whatever, that's out of your hands. Somebody right. else has to, you know, publish that, buy that, whatever. You really don't have as much control over that. So you, if you can enjoy the process of actually creating it, then you're a winner already before you have to start that other process. And I see a yeah. lot of people burn out because of that, I think, because they don't really embrace that. Right, right. So it sounds like Shotguns and Sorcery at the beginning was game related. Yeah. Um, we had a stall and a start and four children and it sat, uh, came back as fiction, but then went back to gaming again. And when did it make that transition back and how did that come together? Well, uh, we had these guys come up and try to license it for an, what they called an enhanced ebook edition. And they had done some like, uh, God, what the heck was the name of it? Some kind of Frankenstein enhanced Frankenstein ebook, right? That had done really well on Kickstarter. And they're like, oh, yeah, we're going to do a whole bunch of these and we're going to get to yours too. And I'm like, great. And then their second Kickstarter flopped and the whole thing went kablooey and just disappeared. The whole company went bankrupt. I'm like, oh. <laughs> but the artist they had teamed me with, a guy named Jeremy Muller, is like, oh, but I love this stuff. I want to do something with them. I'm like, well, that's great. You know, come up with something. We'll talk about it. He's like, I want to do a role playing game. I'm like, nah, I, I do role playing games. If I'm going to do that, I want to do it myself. But after like yeah. two years of him bugging me and me not doing it, I'm like, you know what? <laughs> You're right. I'm not going to get around to this ever. So here, go ahead, run with it. I'll write it. You do the artwork and, you know, run a Kickstarter. And he licensed the Cypher system from Monty Cook Games and came up with a whole role playing game for it, did a Kickstarter that did pretty well. Uh, then he ended up having some internal problems that caused it to be delayed. Like, several years right so mm. uh, it was delayed like four years before it finally came out at which point the license was expiring and i'm like jeremy um do you really want to keep doing this or he's like yeah well, i want to finish i'm like yeah but you know maybe you have, you know four years five years down the line maybe you want to just do your own thing instead so i said look how about i take this back over i'll finish the writing you'll finish the artwork we'll deliver it we'll call it done right and we managed right. to do that um and then after sat for uh, uh, after we finished that and got the last damn bit of it out to the backers, and again I wasn't you know financially responsible for any of that, but I knew that ethically, morally, karmically, yeah. whatever it had my name on, it was my creation. I had to make sure it got done. So we once we managed to get the last bit of that out, then we launched a Kickstarter for a fifth edition source book based on the same material, uh, using the artwork that Jeremy had done, plus some new stuff that we, they did for it as well. And that is that just got fulfilled uh, last fall, and uh, my son Patrick is currently doing the virtual tabletop for Shard, which we had promised people too. Uh, and once that's done, then I'm going to release it to the public. And uh, at the moment, you can still order on Backer Kit if you go to shotgunsandsorcery.com. You can go and order copies of that. And I got a stack of them here in my office behind me. <laughs> yeah. um, but you know, it's one of those things. Like I do these projects because I love them, but I don't expect to make money off them. I'm not expecting to uh, sell them in bookstores or comic stores or yeah. games or whatever. I just do the Kickstarter. Selling an independent role-playing game nowadays is hard. 
And yeah. I don't really have the time or the bandwidth to spend the time marketing it. So I'm like, okay, we'll do the Kickstarter. We'll fulfill it. We'll put it up on drive through RPG, print on demand, whatever else, go. And that's where we're at with that right now. Um, if it does well, great. If not, you know, that's okay. We still had fun. Again, I think the, t- the key is making sure you have fun with the initial process and not worrying about the long-term prospects. Of it, right. How much changed, Matt, between having this in the cipher system versus having it in 5e? Is the is it did a lot change? Did not much change? How do you how do you compare them for yourself? Well, the funny part is originally it was going to be a third edition setting, right? So it would have made more yeah. sense to go right to fifth. But at the time we were looking at doing the role playing game, fifth edition wasn't open. There was a couple of years there at the beginning of fifth edition where they hadn't signed it over to the OGL yet. And so we're like, well, we're not going to sit around and wait. And the Monty Cook guys are good guys. Monty actually edited the first book I ever wrote that was my own solo book, speaking of things that I felt like I owned, uh, which was Western Hero. I wrote that for Iron Crown Enterprises back in like 91, 92. And Monty was the director of the uh, Hero Games line for Iron Crown back in those days. So, wow. Um, so when I had a chance to work with Monty again, I'm like, oh, sure, this is great. You know, uh, we're old buddies from way back. And this, you know, the Cypher system is a great system. The interesting thing about the Cypher system is it doesn't play like D&D. There's, uh, it's all right. the roles are player facing. The the narrator, game master, whatever, whatever you want to call them, doesn't roll any dice, right? So things change from that point. I mean, there's actually also a uh, a magic item economy that works, and it's you know, like D and D of gold pieces, blah blah blah, whatever. But or experience points. But in uh, the cipher system, there's a magic system economy that's for like little tiny ciphers, as they call them, mm-hmm. that you they're expected to uh, collect and use like candy, right? To not hoard them or whatever, but to just chew through them like crazy so we did redesign some of the uh the magic to go around that when we did the cypher system edition then when the fifth edition system came out we had to redesign it again <laughs> to fit the cypher system stuff that we had come up with and right it worked out pretty well actually uh for the cypher system edition we had a guy named rob schwalb come in and help us out uh rob Rob's is, been on the show too he's yeah. a great guy we're one of my favorite great guy <laughs> Uh, Rob and I share a birthday, actually, which we're really no first. kidding. Yeah, August fourth. Uh, Rob is currently, uh, if this comes out soon, uh, Rob is currently kickstarting um, the Weird Wizard, something uh, Shadow of the Weird Wizard, which is his latest yep. in his Shadow Games, which is a sequel to the Shadow of the Demon Lord. Uh, and Rob, this is just great. If you get a chance, go back. If you like fantasy stuff, especially dark fantasy stuff, Demon Lord's much darker. Weird Wizard yes. is a little bit uh, more family friendly, but yeah. um, I, I've seen Rob make people's toes curl at conventions because they play <laughs> Demon Lord with them. Uh, but you know, it's just such great fun. And uh, so Rob did the Cypher System rules for that because he'd already done some Cypher System stuff. And gotcha. he knew the system dead solid. Uh, and then when we did the fifth edition system, our fifth edition source book, I brought my son Mar- Marty in, who's my eldest kid, the one who came before the Quadruplets. Right. Uh, who was. When I was writing Brave New World, uh, Marty was an infant, and I was—I literally would put him on my lap and reach over him to reach my keyboard <laughs> so I could type this stuff. <laughs> oh, and his name was Rebel. There, we called him. We used him as the uh, as the example character, example player in the in the book. Isn't that funny? And I have a friend, Marcelo Figueroa, worked for AG for many years, and still to this day, if you see Marty, he'll say, "Hey, Rebel, what's shaking?" <laughs> and, um, and Marty's like, who are you again? Oh, yeah. You're the guy who still calls me Rebel. Okay. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, we yeah, we had a ball work on that stuff. Uh, Marty came in and he did the fifth edition rules for me. Uh, and then Marty also helped me on the Marvel game. So we wrote all the profiles uh, for the Marvel game, which was 130 no kidding. pages out of the book. So, wow. Uh, it's kind of fun having He's 24 years old now. He's married. He lives up in Appleton, which is a couple hours away from me. Um, but it's kind of strange having a second generation game designer, uh, you know, working with me. And I'm like, when he first said he was going to do this, I'm like, Oh man, are you sure? Holy Christ. It's not easy. I mean, yeah. I've done this and I do pretty well at it. And you probably think it's easy watching me do it. But, <laughs> but I look back at my, my history of doing this and I have a, a lot of friends who washed out in my, you know, I looked at back in the wake there just to see them on other shores. Um, but, you know, Marty's got uh, me to help him out, I guess. So nepotism is, is a great thing. <laughs> Were you surprised when Marty said, Dad, I think I want to do this? I guess I wasn't surprised. I think he had kind of always been angling in that direction. But I mm-hmm. was still a little surprised. When he said, he's like, yeah, I want to do this for a living. I'm like, oh, oh, oh. 
Mm, really? <laughs> yes. yeah. uh, you could be a banker. That, We've talked about this. <laughs> the funny thing is he's, he's good at it. He's really good at it. He's probably a better writer than I was at that age. And, uh, I, I, cause I edited his stuff before we sent it out to anybody or whatever. Uh, and he's just been amazing at it. He's, uh, the neat thing about it is I have more work than I can do these days. People ask me right. for all sorts of stuff and I haven't had to go look for work for 10 years or so, but I got to knock with it so it doesn't happen. Yeah. So when people ask me, can you, do you have time for this? I'm like, mm, no, but I have a young man I've been <laughs> mentoring here <laughs> who would be awesome at this. So. If you want uh, a four-back, so, I've got a four-back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it's another M four-back, right? You can just start there. Uh, so he's he's actually gotten some books that he's written with me, just like, you know, basically setting up the deal and then editing it or polishing it when he's done. And honestly, it doesn't take much. He's, he's a really clean writer and does some good stuff. That's so great. I've been pleasantly surprised by all of it all along the way. Now, have any of the other kids expressed any interest or inclination towards this? Well, uh, Patrick is actually studying uh, comp- video game design uh, over at UW Whitewater. He started UW Studies over at Whitewater, uh, and actually taught a class at UW Stout a couple of years ago during <laughs> the pandemic because they were shy of a teacher one time. They're like, "Oh," uh, and Jay Little, who was a teacher there, worked for Fantasy Flight as game designer for many years. Yeah, recommended me for the gig, and I'm like, "Okay," so I stepped in, and uh, I'm like, "I don't know, what I'm, this is two dimensional video game design." I'm like, guys, so sure, I'll give it a shot. Um, what I learned is that the academic world pays you based upon how much education you have and I've only got a bachelor's degree. So like, no, I don't think I want to make this a permanent gig. Yeah. Um, but Pat's doing that. He's, he's excited about that. I'm not sure where he's going to end up if he's going to be working with me or somebody else. Uh, and then Marty, cause I do a lot of video game work too. I've, I've, uh, that's actually been the bulk of my income for like the last five, seven years, something like that. Right. Uh, and then uh, Nicholas actually is interested in writing as well. He's one of the quadruplets along with Patrick. And he actually uh, worked on a, what the heck was the name of the book? Oh, I have a copy sitting right next to me. The Game Master's Book of Astonishing Random Tables, right? Very and nice. If you look at the cover of it, it actually says, contributions from Jim Davis and Marty, Matt, and Nick Forbeck, because the three <laughs> of us got together and wrote a uh, fifth edition adventure for it. So um so nick is is thinking about doing stuff like that although he's still early in his college years and trying to figure out what he wants to do entirely so uh helen has talked about it a few times but is more into anthropology that's what they want to do um Very and cool. kenny um who's the last of them well not the last uh, the last quadruple i'm mentioning here the uh, fourth, he's, yep. <laughs> yeah, he's in uh, um environmentalism right so he spends Very all his cool. time out in the woods and uh, studying plants and leaves and animals and all sorts of great stuff. So he, he comes to Gen Con with us whenever he can. He plays lots of games. He loves doing that stuff. But his passion is not design. It's about their being outside and, you know, helping out the environment, showing people it's how to love it. So, which he is fantastic at. And for those of you listening, if you follow Matt on Facebook, which I do, and I've been for a while now, one of my favorite things is the convention pictures with you and the kids uh, <laughs> was you just, you do a great job of saying, I got the whole brood here and we're about to play this. Um, and, it, and I think that's really, it's as a father of a much smaller brood, <laughs> it, 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 it makes me warm inside. Like that's, that's cool. That's very, very cool when that happens. So, guys, we're going to take another break. When we get back from the break, we're going to get to the game that I know you're dying for us to talk about. We're going to talk about Marvel Multiverse. This is the part of many podcasts where someone comes on, interrupts the show, and explains that you should consider paying for the content that you're listening to right now for free. That pitch man explains by giving a dollar or more a month, you not only support the show, but you allow the show to grow and improve. Here on the third floor, we refuse to interrupt your episode of Tabletop Talk with such time-wasting pleas. We pledge never to run a spot asking you to go to patreon.com and give a dollar or more a month because supporting content creators keeps the content coming. Even if there is a link in the show's description, and there is, we don't ask you to click it and become a patron. We don't waste time rambling about the benefits like early access to episodes, getting episodes without ad breaks like this, or even getting a chance to play in one of Craig's RPG sessions. Anyway, 
Enjoy this episode knowing Tabletop Talk, despite being supported by its patrons, won't engage in such blatant appeals for support. So I talked about the museum, but I took my daughter to the, the Matt Forbeck Museum. And we talked about, you know, one of the uh, exhibitions there, but um, the one that she's most excited to get to is this one. And uh, Matt, I think the first thing that, um, well, a lot of things to talk about. One, when it first was kind of put out there that you were going to be involved with this game, I cannot express you how excited I was. And that's because of your love of Marvel, um, which is well documented. You wrote the encyclopedia on it for crying out loud. Um, so I was just like that. And he's a great designer. So I was just like, this is, this is going to be fantastic. But that the thing was in talks in the works long before that first announcement came out that you're going to be involved. So when did this like start to come together? Like who approached whom and like, how did this happen? Well, um, yeah, I mean, it was originally John knee's idea. John, it was at the time publisher of Marvel comics and uh, this was back in like 2020, just before the uh, pandemic started, before the lockdown. So the last thing that happened before the lockdown professionally for me was going to C2E2 in Chicago, which is a convention down there. And uh, when I got there, I had a meeting with John. And he's like, uh, I'd like you to work on this game here, right? Uh, you know, John, I had first met. John was originally the vice president of Wildstorm, which was Jim Lee's division <laughs> yeah. of Image Comics, right? And I had met him back in the early 90s when I got hired on to uh, help uh, design a game called Wildstorms, which was a collectible card game for them that Jim and a guy named Drew Bittner, who was one of their editors, had designed. And they, they're like, well, you know, we got this game here, but mm, it probably sucks. We need somebody who knows what they're, what they're doing. <laughs> the art's great. In. Yeah, well, the art is great, right? Of course, because it's you know, Jim and all the other guys at Wildstorm who do this amazing stuff. We're like, the game probably sucks. We probably need somebody who's a third party to come in and help us figure this out. So uh, they brought me in to do it. And uh, did it I suck? Came in, uh, it did. <laughs> 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 it did. It was it was way too complicated. Yeah. Right? And it's, it was just a fairly typical first time game designer problem. Right. I mean, there's some really great ideas in there. We kept as much of it as we could. But. Uh, there was like so many different stats and so many different things going on. I'm like, man, nobody's ever going to be able to finish this in any kind of time at all. And it's right. gonna, uh overcomplicate things when you don't need to. And uh, a lot of game design is actually whittling things away, it turns yeah. out. right? So uh, try to get away with as little as you possibly can. And so they brought me in to do that and help them out. And, uh, you know, Jim was overseeing the whole thing with John. And then Drew and I ended up doing most of the work on the game as far as uh, the game design went. So, <laughs> That went pretty well. I mean, it sold like crazy. We made a lot of money off it. And, um, I kept in touch with John a lot over the years. You know, Jim eventually sold Wildstorm to DC Comics, and now he's the creative director over there. So he's doing all right. He's doing okay. Jim did all right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for a massively talented guy as he is, so he really is. He's stunningly good, right? Yeah, he really is. And I've heard he's a great person, too. He's, he's such a sweetheart. Yeah, and he's a gamer from way back. I mean, one of the first things we talked about was – uh, he talked about how much he loved playing the original Dune board game. No right? kidding. Uh, yeah. So, and I tracked down a copy for him. This is back when eBay was not even really a thing. But I knew this guy, Crazy Igor, sold uh, <laughs> used games. He used to have a booth at Gen Con where he's like, you know, buy five games for 20 bucks or something like that. those liquidated stuff. And I don't know. Paul was his name. I'm not sure what happened to Crazy. So, uh, but yeah, great, great guy. Um uh, and so I managed to track down a copy of that for Jim and got it to him as a thank you for hiring me on because he had uh, done very well by me. And so, you know, many years later, John and I have kept in contact. We've been, you know, I can't tell you how many conventions the years over we've seen each other. And he says, yeah, I want you to do this. I'm like, well, that's that's a good choice, John. You should want to do this. <laughs> I mean, as you say, my, my uh, Christ, you look at my career and it's like, yeah, I've written comics. I wrote a couple editions of the Marvel Encyclopedia, Avengers Encyclopedia, Captain America book. I wrote dialogue for a couple different Marvel MMOs for video games. I, uh, I designed a game called Marvel Heroes Battle Dice that was a mass market game for Playmates Toys. Um, 
I've been, you know, reading Marvel comics forever. Yeah. Plus all the different stuff I've done for role playing games. So uh, I was a pretty easy choice. In fact, I even worked on the last edition of the Marvel role playing game, uh, the Marvel heroic game. No I was kidding. One of the Illuminati, uh, which are this original team that Cam Banks brought together to help him, you know, uh, conceptualize how he wanted the game to work. Uh, and that's really Cam's design. Though. I mean, he was really the, the genius behind that game. Uh, so he had more power to him for that. He did, that became the Cortex system, which is now being used for all sorts of different things. Uh, and a good buddy of mine from way back. I get, you, you get to work with your friends. It's that's one of the so best cool. in the industry. Right? Um, but yeah, John called me and said, hey, I want you to work on this. We brought in another guy named Mike Caps who was going to help out for a while, and he ended up having to leave. But Mike is uh, another brilliant designer. Holy Christ, is he smart. He's... Uh, uh, he was working at Epic, uh, the video game company, and he was the lead writer behind Years of War and Fortnite. And, uh, he's got a doctorate in mathematics. He went to undergrad at MIT and all wow. this stuff. And, um, and yeah, I mean, it was great to work with him on that too. So it was neat to uh, then, you know, then we worked on the game in quiet, private for a long time before we finally announced it. And then we came out with a playtest version that came out last April, April 22. That was like a ten dollar, one hundred and twenty page book, kind of saying, "Hey guys, this is what we're thinking about," and uh, did a public play test for it. We got tens of thousands of responses for it. Right? That's unbelievable. Oh, it was nuts. It was uh, just incredible. So I'm going to pause us there because this is going to be an important part of this conversation. But there's a lot that's already happened before that play test comes out. So you had this conversation. Says, "Hey, I want you to work on this." You're like, "Great idea." That's who I would have recommended to is me. Um. And, you know, you shake hands and at some point you've got to sit down. Like, where do you where do you freaking start? It's a lot. But, yeah, I've, I've done this before. And you know, I had Mike I was working with, so that helped a bit. But, um, you know, first thing we want to do is figure out who is the game for. Right. Right. Um, and that's a big thing that I think a lot of people don't talk about when they're doing game design because they think, I just want to make this game that I think is going to be the best thing ever. And you should, that's a great ambition. It should be the best thing ever, right? But again, especially when you're trying to do something for a large publisher like this, you need to think, who is this game for? Uh, there's a guy named Mike Gray. who was a friend of mine who used to be the game ex- acquisition director at Hasbro. And he worked <laughs> for TSR back in the day and did a lot of great stuff. Um, I think Shogun was one of his games. A whole bunch of big Milton Bradley board games, right? And... Uh, he often would say, you know, when you're starting out to design a game, you need to figure out if it's art or commerce, right? Interesting. And if it's art, you do whatever the hell you want. <laughs> you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about, is it going to fit on a shelf or, you know, is it going to cost too much to produce or any of that kind of stuff? But if it's commerce, then you need to actually have those parameters in mind when you begin. Yeah. So the first thing to do is figure out, like, roughly what do you want it to look like? Is it going to be one book? Is it going to be three books? Is it going to be a box set? Are we capable of pulling that kind of stuff off? Uh, and in most cases, we try to do stuff that we thought would be gentle on Marvel, right? Mm-hmm. How, when you say that, that, what does that mean? Marvel is very good at publishing books, right? Right. But they don't do things like dice or box sets or stuff like that. But they're really good at publishing books. They've been bu- publishing books for 80 some years now. Yeah. Uh, so for them to come out with a hardcover book, not a big deal. For them to figure out all the other stuff, uh, that means they have to build systems to be able to deal with that source things, all that. Right. And that complicates things. So rather than do that, let's focus on the things you're really good at that we know we can deliver. And if we can deliver a game that you can play out of a book instead of a box, better yet. (laughs) Fortunately, it's a role playing game. (laughs) Right. (laughs) It's entirely doable. Um, And then, you know, it's questions like, should it be one book or three? Should it be uh, a series of things? How are we going to do this? How big should it be? Should it, you know, all this stuff. And how did you navigate those types of questions, Matt? I mean, those are huge choices to make early on. Well, a lot of time, uh, gaming is an iterative design process, right? So a lot of time what you do is say, I want to do this. And then everybody tells you you're an idiot. <laughs> you're like, I think, is idiot and iterative the same thing? They're probably the same. <laughs> They're probably enough, all, right? all goes back to Greek somewhere. <laughs> you know, and then you, you sit there and you're like, well, but I, and then you have to justify why you wanted to do it that way. And they have to tell you you're wrong because of this. And then you have to figure out if, you're, if they're right, you know, and then you have to adapt and adjust. Um, but that's one of the great things about game design. It's always an iterative process. Right. By the time it gets into anybody's hands, it's probably been worked over a dozen times, if not a few dozen times. And, uh, you know, with the play test, we actually ended up 
you know, putting it in people's hands and then reworking it another dozen yeah. times or so. Yeah. So that was a, a wonderful challenge. Uh, and I enjoyed it, actually. It was a lot of fun. But yeah, I mean, trying to figure out who the game is for and how you want to do it, those become the the uh, the guideposts by which you can navigate, right? So for us, we were aiming for two different groups of people. We were aiming for gamers who love Marvel to start with, right? So we're like, okay, largest group of tabletop role-playing gamers is obviously D&D. We want a game that people who play D&D will look at and say, I can move into that. I can just kind of step over to the side. And I'm like, right. We're not going to do a 5e clone. We're not going to do any of that kind of stuff, but it's going to use a lot of the same vocabulary uh, so that they don't feel like, well, that's kind of goofy, strange. I don't get it, right? We want them to instantly go, yo, I already know how to play this game, essentially, right? We're going to use different dice, blah, 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 whatever. Uh, but I know how to play the game. You know, We also wanted to go after people who are um, Marvel fans who are RPG curious, Right. Interesting. So those are people who, you know, love Marvel, either movies, television, comic books, video games, whatever. But when they look over at the D&D guys, think, you know, pointy ears and, and crazy swords are goofy. You know, nobody they, they think wizards hats are, are for right. nerds or whatever. So and I'm like, hey, I'm one of those. But anyway, you know, it's uh, but you want people who are like uh, they would be willing to take a step into role playing, but didn't really want to play a wizard. They wanted to play Captain America or whatever. Right. right? Or their own superhero. So that those are the two groups we were trying to go after, and that meant that we that guided our design in a lot of ways. That meant that we were going for uh, things that were generally going to be simple to start with, and then have some depth to them later. Right. Interesting. So the basic mechanics had to be really simple, but then you know the powers and such we could layer on and make them as complicated or as as crunchy as we wanted them to be. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that I think really helped us out. I mean, the the original playtest version was a lot crunchier than we ended up being. Because I think when we came out with it, we're like, well, we know that we can do this for, you know, uh, hardcore gamers will buy into this. And a lot of people will buy anything that says Marvel on it because it says Marvel, right? But we want to make it so, something that they're eager to buy and eager to play because we don't want this to be something that just has a Marvel logo slapped on it and shoved out the door. We want this to be something we can work on for years and enjoy with people for years. And I think we got to that point. Actually, yeah. I think we do. I've been pretty happy with the results so far. Um, as somebody who's very fascinated by the creative process, Matt, it was really interesting to see both books um, because <laughs> I, I love seeing the journey. Right. That's that's the whole idea behind this podcast. And 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 that's what you guys ended up doing for me is is showing me, you know, version five and version 10, which was wonderful. Going back to before the playtest still, though, who's the first one that said six one six? Well, that was me and Mike Caps and Johnny all together. Actually. Really? We all worked together. I think it might have been. Caps who came up with the math. I know it was Caps who did the math because, uh, again, he had that doctorate in mathematics, right? So uh, for him to say, look, we can actually make this work. <laughs> I'm like, well, you know, you're going to change because the, the, it's a 3D6 system, but one of the dice is an unusual die that doesn't have a one on it. It's got two sixes instead. And that die, how is that going to affect things, right? Statistically speaking. And then it's going to be a bell curve as opposed to a flat curve like you get in Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and is all the math going to work? And I trusted Mike to do a lot of that math work because, you know, again, he was pretty good at it. Uh, yeah. As we were doing the, after he had left and I had to be doing a lot of this on my own, I was looking at the math going, man, I got four terms of calculus and I'm having a hard time sometimes <laughs> doing this. So we probably need to slim this down a little bit. So that's when we ended up doing stuff that I thought that, you know, my my general idea was that if uh, if it was too complex for a third grader to handle, you know, uh, a smart third grade or whatever, then we were probably going too hard as far as mm-hmm. uh, the math goes. So like we have single digit multiplication, right? And uh, double digit, maybe even triple digit addition and subtraction. That's it. Right. As far as the complexity of the math. And uh, again, that's something you learn in third grade. So you should be able to handle that stuff. And if you can't, I mean, not everybody can do triple digit math in their heads. I don't do it all that well all the time, especially <laughs> at a convention after on Sunday, after four <laughs> days of doing it. Calculators are your friends. We have everybody's got one in their pocket nowadays with their, yep. their phone. So uh, don't be shy about using it. Right. It's uh, as I often tell people about the game, we're not trying to make it hard on you. We're trying to you know provide you as many tools as you can to have fun. And that's really what it came down to at the end. So early on, Matt, um, do you remember a decision of adding or subtracting early on that 
really set you down the path um, where it started to click and you said, this is this is starting to feel right to me. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of things that we did, but uh, there are a couple ones that really stood out to me. Uh, and most of them came after the playtest came out, right? Um, we had archetypes in the first playtest. They're mm-hmm. kind of like classes in Dungeons & Dragons. And as, as we were looking at them, I'm like, you know, and as I started designing lots and lots of different characters, I'm like, you know what? These are just getting in the way. Yeah. Um, they do give you, they push you in certain directions, but some of them were so stilted to go in these directions. I'm like, I don't think this really feels very organic and fun, really, was the key thing. Um, and so I said, what happens if we just throw those out, right, and give people other frameworks with which to build their characters, which we actually had several already. So I'm like, do we really need this one? Let's pop this one out. Is this a load-bearing wall? <laughs> really right. was the question, right? And it turns out, no, we can open it up. It's like one of those uh, you know, HGTV shows, you know, the Property Brothers coming in. <laughs> yeah, the Let's knock out, out this wall. <laughs> exactly. Um, and it worked great. I'm like, okay, great. We got that done. That was fun. Uh, the other thing that really changed the, the system was when um, instead of going, originally you had, you know, you uh, roll the dice to hit or to do an action. And then each character had their own damage that was determined by their statistics. Right. And I'm like, well, that's, you know, that's okay. But it, it means it gets kind of samey after a while. If you know, you're going to do the same amount of damage every time. And we're like, well, do we want to put a roll onto it? And we had a roll. Then we bracketed the roll because we didn't watch it after roll. I mean, the first time we did, it was like, pick up like, 16 <laughs> d6s and go right and i'm like well that's gonna be a lot to ask somebody to go collect or they have to re-roll them over and over and over and over so i'm like okay let's bracket it so now you can only roll 3d6 but you know you have a certain uh flat bonus that goes in right I'm like that's great but again it's more math and it's it tends to make things feel a little samey so what can we do to break that out and i was kind of against using multiplication because you know a little higher order math and some sure. people cringe when they start thinking oh my times table shit um i said okay we're only going to stick to one digit for this and we're going to take it so that when you roll your to hit with your 616 your d616 if your special die the marvel got die comes up uh, when that comes up that's actually going to be a you're going to multiply that times your rank which nice. was really what your level is so to speak in the original game we had ranks or the original playtest we had ranks going up to like 25 or 30 even we you know i think we published 25 but we even add up to 30 and uh, we brought that down to six ranks, kind of, you know, brought everything together, made it a little bit more simple. And I'm like, Oh, well six, we could do six times six. That's easy. Right. Anybody can do six times six. And uh, I'm like, Oh, if we multiply it, that gives us something we can do there. That uh, there's some really interesting math in there that comes out too, that uh, is kind of hidden that mm. uh, uh, originally my producer, CJ Cervantes, was like, yeah, we should do multiplication. I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, multiplication is tough. People don't like it. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. We got six ranks now. Yeah, we can do it. Let's check and see how this works. And one of the neat things about it is uh, when you're rolling the six, one, six, when you're trying to roll to hit somebody or, or punch somebody or shoot them or whatever, if it's easy for you to do that, you have a large range of numbers that'll work. And then your damage is calculated off your success from those numbers, right? <clears throat> if it's really hard for you to do it, you have a very narrow band of successes that'll work for you, mm. right? And those are big numbers, right? Like you might have to get a five and a six and whatever, you know, you know two fives and a six or whatever to pull it off. And since your damage is based off that roll, the harder it is for you to hit somebody, when you actually do hit them, you're always going to do some pretty serious damage, right? right? Which actually feels like a superhero thing. It feels yep. like it's, you know, because I always hated this bit in games where you're like, I'm going to, when you had roll to hit and roll to damage, right? You're like, I roll to hit. Oh, I finally, I finally stabbed the dragon. I got him right in the heart. I'm really going to get him, right? And you roll damage, you're like two points of damage. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> and this solved that really well. And I was like, oh, man, yeah, we got to use that. So yeah. uh, I was pretty thrilled. And you know, a lot of it's like, you know, I'm not a mathematical genius by any means, but it was mostly like, let's try things until we stumble upon something that works. Right. And I would imagine, Matt, keep me honest here, you got such an incredibly powerful touchstone that I would imagine you you knew when it felt right. Yeah, that helps a lot. I mean, when you're like, and again, CJ was uh, banging the gong on this the entire time going, does it feel like a Marvel game? Um, You know, for a lot of times you're like, well, it feels like a superhero game, but does it feel like a Marvel game? And that was, again, one of our touchstones is to say that we need to make sure it feels like a Marvel game at all times. Right. 
uh, not something that can be genericized into whatever else you want to do. I mean, I'm sure if we wanted to, we could take it, reskin it, do something else with it. But uh, we wanted this to feel like you're you know, in the middle of a Marvel comic or a Marvel film or a television yeah. show or whatever else. So that when things happen, they're like, oh, yeah, I get it. I know that stuff, especially if you're a Marvel fan like you. Christ, Marvel is one of the most recognizable brands in the world right now. I think it actually it's amazing, is the most it? recognizable one, right? I think it topped Disney, actually, finally. Wow. And, you know, Disney's like, well, I guess we own you. That's okay. So, <laughs> um, but it's because of that, uh, everybody's got a lot of ideas about what it's supposed to yeah. mean and what it's supposed to work like and look like. And we try to be true to those, right? It's one thing. It's interesting because you have this huge built-in audience but then you have to work to that audience right you can't say well this is how it is and they say well that's not marvel i have to say no you're wrong right. <laughs> you, know, you have to say no that really feels right right like yep. the d616 system the main reason we came up with the number and the name for that is because 616 is the earth that the marvel comics universe is set in the main marvel comics universe is earth 616 which is based on a joke that alan moore threw into a uh, comic like uh, a Captain Britain comic like 30 years ago. Oh, I right? don't know this story. Yeah, because, well, in DC Comics, there uh, Earth-1 is your main DC world, or was right. back before the crisis and everything else. And then Earth-2 is the Golden Age comics. And Alan was making a joke about, it. well, yeah, of course, you're most important. You're Earth-1 and 2, right? Um, but, you know, what's Marvel? Earth-616, you know, it's like some random street number, essentially, that he pulled out of his whatever. And, oh, that's um, funny. Yeah, so I mean, you know, it's become this uh, this big thing of canon nowadays. It's Earth six one six, right? Every Earth has got its own number, um, and uh, you know that, and the fact that the Marvel, the stats of Marvel are melee, agility, resilience, vigilance, ego, and logic, and the first letters of those spell Marvel, right? Yeah, and again, it's one of those things like, well, yeah, it's goofy, it's a little gimmicky, but it fits really well, and it's a great mnemonic. So let's stick with that. So. Um, and it tells people that you're a fan and you're having fun with it. Because, I mean, that's one of the things about Marvel Comics, too, is we, they always have fun, right? It's, it's it, you know, Even when Stan Lee was doing it, he was talking to, like, face front, true believers, Excelsior. Like, yeah. It's fun. Yeah, there's always a certain uh, almost tongue-in-cheek enthusiasm behind it, but it, but it's in earnest, and w- which is part of the reason that, you know, that defines it. And there's something that's very important to me that you said, Matt, I want to go back to it, which is I, I wanted this to be a Marvel game, not just a superhero game. Now, as a person who has loved comic books since I was uh, learned to walk and learned to read, the first thing I learned how to read was comic books and a Marvel fan for a very long time. I know exactly what you meant when you said that, <laughs> right? Yeah. I'm like, oh, yes, not a superhero game, a Marvel game. But then as we are talking, I'm like, well, if so, what happened? Like, how do I explain that to somebody? Right. It's so, tough. It, I, it <laughs> is right. It, it, do you, did you get a sense of that? Like what, what is that differentiator for you? I, to me, it's about the drama. It's about the flawed, the flawed hero, right? Uh, DC, which was the progenitor for a lot of this stuff. Their characters were always, akin to modern day gods and they actually right. lean into that pretty hard right i mean superman wonder woman batman green lantern these are modern day gods the gods are walking the earth right marvel comics you're not gods you're just schlubs who happen to have power right and then have to figure out how to, what are you going to do with it are you going to save yeah. your family i mean spider-man's the great example of that you know he loses his uncle ben because he didn't act when he had a chance to and with great power comes great responsibility and uh, that to me is the main theme of Marvel Comics, right? And it's just average people who have got these abilities and have to do something to help other people with them. Yeah. And I think that's the main thing about it. And they don't generally place themselves as gods. I mean, the people in Marvel that place themselves as gods, those are the villains. Right. right. Um, so to me, that's really what a lot of Marvel is all about. And I really enjoyed leaning into that. I think the, the game system does that pretty well. And, 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 and I totally agree with everything you just said. What I'm and you know, it's one thing to design the game to capture the powers and the, the battles between the thing and the Hulk and you destroy New York City in the process. It's another thing to try to capture what makes Marvel Marvel, which is Peter Parker trying to pay the rent and and and, and those types of things. How did you address that in the game and, and how did you bring that to life? Well, we have this system called tags and traits that does that kind of stuff. So uh, originally it was just traits and we're like, okay, you have to pick, you know, you get certain traits that come with your origin and your occupation. So when you're creating a character, first thing you do is figure out how they got their powers, what they do for a living. Right. 
And then you got to figure out what rank they are that tells you roughly how many powers you get on top of that, right? But the origins, uh, the origin of the occupation tell you what kind of traits and tags you start out with. And those describe things about your character. Traits are things that have mechanical effects that, you know, are often to your benefit, right? And we wanted to limit that so you only have a certain number of them you get. But tags are st- something that just describes your character and may come up and play at some point. But the things like secret identity versus public identity or, or uh, I'm poor or I'm rich or whatever, right? Uh, you know, some other games have done things like, okay, we're going to be poor. That means you only got X number of dollars per week. I'm like, man, I don't know about you, but I don't go to these <laughs> things so I can budget. Right? <laughs> I get enough of that in real life, right? Um, so we try to make it so it's more of a story oriented thing as opposed to now you need to break out your calculator and figure out where you're, are you, do you have enough to pay off your mortgage this month or, you know, what's my, my capital investment rate or whatever, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So yeah, that helped out with that. We all, I, there's a big section of book at the beginning for players. And then also have a big section about for narrators at the end talking about how to run a game, how to make it feel like a Marvel game. Uh, what the spirit of the game is. And I think that's something that a lot of games tend to overlook, yeah. right? They just say, here's the game and you'll figure it out. But I think uh, the spirit of the game really is like, when you're playing the game, are you trying to play it so it feels like it's a Marvel game or not? Uh, my big example for that is often like, if you're playing D&D, for instance, and uh, the moment you sit down, one of the guys starts saying, well, let's go see if we can invent gunpowder, right? And you're like, well, Probably, you know, sure. But <laughs> is it really D and D at that point? You know, right. then you should go play shotguns and sorcery because we got good powder now. Right? <laughs> but you know, if the game is about wizards and you know uh, crazy wizards and brutal swords people and whatever, and and you're like, well, let's you know blow things up. Maybe you should be playing a different game, right? Right. Um, so part of it is saying, well, you know, that's not in the spirit of the game. I actually had to teach my kids this when we were starting to play D and D. I'm like. <laughs> They're like, well, can I make Molotov cocktails? I'm like, yeah, sure. But again, maybe that's, you know, that's probably you know a good attack way to do things. It's a great, great way to defend yourself, whatever, blow up buildings, I guess. But uh, does that feel like the Lord of the Rings, right? Does that right. feel like these fantasy novels that we, we've been reading and whatever? And they're like, okay, yeah, I get your point, you know. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, if you want to play that game, we can play that game. Now, I don't tell anybody they can't. If whatever you want to play at your table right. in your house with your friends, whatever you do, whatever makes you have fun. I always say, if you're having fun, if everybody at the table is having fun, you're doing it right. I can't tell you differently, but this is the game that we're designing. So, if you want to play the game the way we think you should play it, this is the way to do it. Yep, yep. It um, and the boy, the, the sections you just talked about um really captured the 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 love of of the source book or the source work that you guys had and and, and they're phenomenal but um was the idea of letting me buy the playtest rules on amazon was that at the from the very beginning you're like we're gonna we're gonna work up to a point we're gonna we're gonna publish not just put it out there for people to look at but actually publish the playtest rules was that from the very beginning or did that come in the process. When did that decision get made? That was actually always the process. John Nee really? actually wanted that when he, when he hired me onto this. He's like, we're going to do it this way. We're going to do a, a preview edition, essentially. And, you know, uh, Wizards had done that with with uh, fifth edition, right? They did mm-hmm. well, whatever the hell they call it. D&D Next, I think is what it was called. Now they're doing it with one D&D uh, for their next edition. Paizo had done it with Pathfinder for second edition. And we're like, you know what? This seems like a good model. It's a good way to get a lot of feedback. One of the challenging things of playtesting a really complex rule system that you get in like collectible card games or uh, role playing games is that it's almost impossible to play test it yourself. There's so many different right. things that can go wrong. There's too many rules. Doesn't matter if I run that game a hundred times or a thousand times, and it's still I'm going to affect it when I run it because I'm going to run things the way I think it should run. Yep. There, uh, on the other hand, you know, if, if I could put it out there on the market and get tens of thousands of responses from people that I'm not in the room with that tell me they think this is broken or that's broken. This is the best part or whatever. Then you're getting unrestricted information from people. It's definitely the best way to go. So that was always the idea from the beginning. Um, And, you know, to get that kind of feedback from people, fortunately we hired in a guy named Amir Osman came in about a year ago, a little bit before the play test stuff came out right around the time. And he's been the assistant producer in the game. And Amir has been great because 
honestly, uh, as much as I'm excited about all that feedback, I don't have time to go through tens of yeah. thousands of responses. So he was able to aggregate that into something that meant something to us, right? Uh, and I often say when you're playtesting, if you if one person tells you that this thing is broken, but everybody else is saying, no, that's great, then you can ignore that person, right? But if everybody or half the people even or whatever are telling it's broken, then you got to address it. And yeah. a lot of times it's not that the bit is broken so much as you didn't express it properly. Right. Right. Uh, when I'm teaching people the game, like I did this at Comic-Con and Gen Con, I'm like, you know, if I if something I say doesn't make sense to you, that's not because you're stupid. It's because I didn't explain it properly. OK, because a lot of people will assume that they're stupid. Right. Because they're like, I'm sitting here down to learn this really complex thing. You're not stupid. It's my job to explain this to you properly. And if, if you're not getting it, I'm assuming you're of at least average intelligence <laughs> and, you know, third grade level of math, or whatever. Sure. I, you know, that's the, that's the goal, right? right? Yeah. Uh, so it's not your fault. Right. And I just need to explain this better for you. And that's my that's why I strive for when I'm writing and when I'm playing it and explaining it to people at conventions or whatever as well. When they started to aggregate the feedback um, and it started to get put in front of you. Um, what was there some large surprises, things that you're like, wow, I hadn't even thought that this would be brought up, but there it's it's a big it's a big it's a big piece of feedback for us. What, what surprised you? Well, that was one of the reasons we threw out the archetypes, actually, right? When we got a bunch of that stuff back, we're like, you know, these aren't working. Um, the thing that always surprised me through every play test was people say, what about all this stuff you haven't told us about yet? I'm like, guys, that's, it says play test right on the cover. That's the whole point. Um, you know, uh, people, for instance, were really excited about magic and, and telep telepathy rules and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, you're in power for that. I'm like, that's great. We have an idea for all that stuff. And I know how it's going to fit in the system. But we need to make sure the basic system sings before right. we can add on those things to it. So and I think we did a decent job of that. It was you now it's like every game in the world. Though. I mean, I could be playtesting this thing for the rest of my life. Um, and at some point the producer or whoever has to drag it out of your fingers and say, nope, time to go to press. And you're like, eh, yep. okay. Yeah. Uh, that's what expansions are for. You know, uh, we're not going to do another edition for hopefully a long time, but we'll end up <laughs> doing new things in expansions that will help build out parts of it. They're like, well, what about that? And okay. Yeah. We could have done more with equipment. Okay. Yeah. We'll do that. But you know, for instance, we could have done more with weapons in the game. There's very little about weapons in the game. And we've had a lot of people say, what about this? And I'm like, well, you know, the problem is uh, what you put in the core rule book becomes what the game is about. And Interesting. a Marvel game shouldn't be about weaponry, right? Uh, it should be about punching people, essentially. Yeah. Right? Um, so, you know, if I put in things that differentiate between different calibers of weapons or what kind of scope you're using on your rifle or whatever, suddenly that becomes what people focus on because you're saying this is important. And I chose not to do that because I wanted to, again, feel more like a Marvel game. Now, when we get to other books that have characters that focus more on that kind of stuff, sure, we'll add in more of those things, right? Because that's where it's appropriate to do that, I think. But I think if you put that in a basic game, you you skew that game then in that direction, right? Yeah, so you're definitely making a statement. A lot of our yeah, we're making a statement about how we wanted the game to be. Yeah. The thing about Marvel, of course, is that you can tell just about any kind of story. I mean, they do comedy, romance, action, spy, whatever, you know, science fiction type stuff, fantasy type stuff. All sorts of different things. And we want to be able to cater all that. But again, you got to go back to, does this feel like a Marvel game to start with? And then you can go riff off in other directions after that. So you've got all this feedback. Um, some things don't change. Some things get thrown out completely. Uh, old ideas come back. I mean, there's a whole process that happens here. What I find interesting, though, Matt, is, is when... When did it all start to come together again, right? As you tear it down, you put it back together. Do you remember when you're like, oh, wait a minute, I think we're close. I remember when we started that, getting to that point. It was uh, last summer. Uh, I was at Comic-Con and we had done, we had done some private play tests with some friends of mine uh, that we brought in and we happened to be at the show. I'm like, hey guys, I want to teach you how to play the game. You're going to break it over your knee for me, right? Um, I remember... Uh, Whitney Beltran was one of them. Her and her husband, Aja George, came in. And Whitney broke that damn game over her knee, like in the first round of combat. And I was like, holy cow. Oh, my God. It's so broken. We need to fix this right away. And we did. But, I mean, she was just – she's brilliant, right? She walks in and says, 
crack. And I'm like, oh, oh, well, that woke me up. Um, you know, in a way that I'm like, well, this is different than the other feedback we've gotten. So this is important. Interesting. And then Ajit basically stood there and said, well, I need to be able to see all this stuff on the character sheet. Where do I find this stuff? I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> that is something that's, you know, it's, I knew it was important, but to have somebody there who you, whose opinion you really value yep. say, how come I can't find this here? And we're like, okay, we need to refocus on things like making sure the system works this way, blah, 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 which, you know, uh, and then making sure that you can play everything off a character sheet. You don't need anything else if you're a player. So right? important. Um, and those, that week that we spent at Comic-Con doing that kind of stuff with people really was valuable to the developer. Wow. I mean, a lot of the stuff we got from people uh, through uh, feedback was things like, do you like this or do you like that? Blah, blah, blah. But to have somebody, have some friends who are really talented designers in their own right to come and say, I see what you're going for here. Why isn't it like this? And you're like, oh yeah, I should do it like that. You're right. So yeah, that was, I thought, really helpful. And, you know, when we started, that's when we started doing things like, uh, should we throw out the damage system and do this whole new thing. Uh, and that's when I think it really started coming together. And, you know, uh, CJ would often say, what can we throw out? Right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I was talking to people about this at the different conventions this summer. I'm like, we stripped this damn thing to the studs and then rebuilt it uh, wow. and made it much faster, better, smarter, cleaner, or lots of other good adjectives, you know, <laughs> it just <laughs> it worked, so. I was stunned at the difference, Matt, uh, and the transformation of it. And um, it, it uh, made me very anxious, you know, to talk through this. And I think you've done a great job, you know, helping me understand that as you've been playing, you've played this game a lot, right? For those of us that just got the book, uh, I haven't had a chance to play the damn thing yet. I haven't finished reading the book, but um, you've been playing it a lot. I would love to hear a Marvel moment. Uh, so in all the times that you've ran the game, is there a moment that really stands out to you that just like, oh, this is we are playing the Marvel role playing game and this is a Marvel moment? Well, there's a couple of couple of things. I mean, I, I basically ran the adventure in the playtest rule book over and over and over. And the funny thing is I probably run it 40 or 50 times. Wow. And every time I step up with it, the characters, the players do something different. And I just <laughs> freaking love that. Right. Isn't that the best? Uh, like one, uh, one of the early adventures, like, okay, a uh, guy's playing Iron Man. It's set in the Tony, it's set in the uh, Anthony, you know, uh, Howard and Maria Stark building that Tony has you know, donated the money for, for galactic research on the ESU campus. And the guy's like, well, do I have access to everything? I'm like, yeah, you probably do. Okay, <laughs> great. So uh, I'm like, that's what a narrator is for. Cause you know, you can't do that kind of stuff in a video game. You can't do that right. in, a, in a board game. When somebody comes up with something, you just go, oh, that's amazing. Right. Uh, uh, as we call it the, the rule of cool, right. If yeah. it sounds cool, then we should let it happen because yep. man. Um, and there was a moment uh, they were doing a live play. The glass cannon network was doing a live play at comic con. And it was the first time I'd ever seen somebody play the game without me running it. Right. Wow. And, uh, you know, because it's not like we're just behind, you know, two way mirrors, one way mirrors, whatever, and, and watching people play like in a market research thing. So it's the first time I'm in the room watching somebody play the published game. Well, I have not taught them a damn thing about it. That's and something. they were great. They were amazing. Right. Uh, they were having so much fun. They just did such a good job. And at one point, Nora Ibrahim was playing in the game and she uh, she's got this character who can phase things. Right. And so, like a Kitty Pride type character. And so we've got these. Hydra guys in this war machine armor coming at them. And she goes, and she goes, can I touch them and phase their armor? And I'm like, <gasps> <laughs> and the, the narrator's like, Troy, the narrator's like, yes, you can. And I'm like, that's the exact right way to do it. Well done. You know, oh, and we all that's just, great. We were like, that is great. It's, it felt like one of those moments where somebody's like, how would I make this power really cool and use it in a way that's really going to help me out here? And man, it was fantastic. And, and in many ways, I would imagine, Matt, that's got to be a, a true bellwether test for you is when you haven't taught Troy how to play. He is he has done the true play test, which is I haven't talked to Matt about this. I'm going to learn the game myself. I'm going to run it. Um, and that's got to be a hell of a moment for you to watch that happen. It's like watching your kid take their first steps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Or teaching him to ride a bike. You're like, I just push them off into the world. And I hope they don't fall too hard when they fall. <laughs> 
wear your helmet. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, on your website, um, I saw a few covers that piqued my interest. Now I knew yeah. about the spider verse that had been talked about a little bit, but I also saw a cover for an X-Men expansion and mm-hmm. a cataclysm of Kang expansion. Um, can you give us a little bit of a look and feel for these and what some of the goals are? Sure. Uh, the first one coming out is the cataclysm of Kang, which comes out in November. It's already on press. And that is actually an adventure. That is a, um, 256 page hardcover. All three, all three of those books are 256 page hardcovers. The Cataclysm of Kang has a has six different adventures in it. They are one adventure for each rank. As I mentioned oh, before, there are six cool. ranks in the game now. So, uh, depending where you want to play with your character or where you want to start with your character, you can start wherever you want and play uh, at rank one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Also, we've got stuff in there. So if you want to create new characters and take them from origin story all the way up to like silver surfer type level powers, you can do that. If you want to, you can play them as individual one shots and play each of them and just link together like during an anthology. You can play the last epic one and then do flashbacks. You know, we don't care how you do it. And we give you all sorts of different uh, advice and uh, means of how to make this into a campaign that you can play at home. So uh, so that's really fun. There's some new new villains in that that I came up with from Marvel. And I'm like, ah, I can't, I can't tell you what they are because I've been so oh, boy. It's fun. So fun. Um, and then, okay, the X-Men book, which I'm currently working on, is going to be coming out in early 2024. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's actually an expansion. So that has a lot of details on mutants, more mutant powers, all sorts of new stuff, uh, like things like the danger room, you know, et cetera. Cool. We're nailing down uh, bits of it as we speak. So that's going to be interesting. <laughs> uh, that, that one's got more, that's more team oriented, right? The X-Men are always more about the team. Right. You know, whether it's X-Men or X-Force or you know, any of the other dozens of spinoff teams they've had over the years. Uh, you know, New Mutants, Hellions, et cetera, the Marauders, all that good stuff. So that'll end up focusing more on teams. Then the Spider-Verse book will come out late next year, and that's going to focus more on multiversal adventures and also uh, the larger cast of characters that come with you, whether you're you know a small group of players or a solo player, you know, like Aunt May and you know all the different parents and girlfriends and boyfriends and et cetera, et cetera, that come with this. Uh, J. Jonah Jameson yelling at you, who's your J. Jonah Jameson, right? Right. Who's making your life miserable, <laughs> that kind of a thing. Um, and doing it across the entire multiverse, of course. So, uh, so that'll be the next one. And then uh, after that, we haven't announced anything. We got a lot of different Beautiful. ideas in the works. We also have announced that Simon is our partner for accessories. Like I mentioned, yes. Marvel, uh, that's not their expertise. So they found some people who it was their expertise. Uh, Simon does amazing stuff. They've already done a couple of great Marvel games. They've got Marvel United and Marvel Zombies, and they do amazing figurines. So they're going to be doing pre painted miniatures for the game and dice and a starter set and screens and all sorts of good fun stuff. Oh, that's exciting. That's very, very exciting. So before we leave uh, the Marvel universe and talk about something else, um, as a kid who read Marvel comics, uh, I've made this joke a few times on the podcast as it's come up in conversation. Had you told 12 year old Craig that Iron Man was going to be a blockbuster movie followed by um, movies about Ant-Man. And then there was going to be an entire series of uh, movies put out where Kang is the major villain in it. I wouldn't have believed any of that. And I feel like uh, you and I had a similar childhood in that way. What has it been like for you to just see what has happened um, with Marvel? It's been fantastic, right? Because I love all this stuff and to have the rest of the world love it with me yeah. is fantastic. Because I mean, Man, I could have quoted you all sorts of different things from Marvel Comics going back to the beginning. And up until about 12 years ago, <laughs> most people wouldn't know what the hell I was talking about. Yeah. Right? Um, also, I think it's funny, you know, the Iron Man, Captain America, the whole Avengers lineup. <clears throat> in the 90s, those were going bankrupt. All those comics were dying. And to the point where they actually split them off and put them in their own universe for a while and let the Image Comics guys draw and write them, Right. Uh, that whole Heroes Reborn, Heroes Return thing. Um, and th- those are the characters that <laughs> had so little value to Marvel that they hadn't already been sold off at that point. Yeah. Right? Spider-Man had been sold off to Sony or licensed, I guess is the right word. Hulk had been licensed to Universal. The X-Men had been licensed to Fox. So those were the hot things, right? Those are the ones that people knew about. 
And then they're like, well, what do we got left? You know, and they give Iron Man to John Favreau, hires in Robert Downey Jr. And holy cow, it was just magical what they pulled off. Right? Yeah. Uh, it really became the foundation of this whole MCU that we have, a Marvel Cinematic Universe that we have now. And, um, yeah, I, I, Stan Lee wouldn't have believed it, right? I don't either think so either. That said, you got to be kidding me. Yep. Right? yep. Now, and, and what's amazing for me, Matt, is my I, I'm a big dork, big geek, big gamer, a big comic book, you know, the whole thing, fantasy, science fiction, the whole thing. Um, my wife, God bless her, has not a geeky bone in her body. Um, has never had any interest in this in in my hobbies in that way, but she watches every single Marvel movie with me, <laughs> every single Marvel show. She loves it, and I think it's a, a real testament to what has been accomplished by Marvel. The fact that they have roped my wife in, and she's not the only one. There's a lot of people that, that and for me, I'm like, now do you get it? Now do you yeah. get why I love it so much? <laughs> exactly. And, you know, it's my wife's very much the same way, right? Just has no interest in reading comic books or playing these kind of games or whatever, but loves watching the shows, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that's a testament to uh, the universality of it and the stuff that Stan and Jack and the rest of the crew came up with and the whole Marvel bullpen over the years yeah. and what it's evolved into. I mean, back when he was starting this kind of stuff too, they, you didn't talk about world building. <laughs> it just kind of, right. He's like, you know, this is a way for us to get people of X-Men to read Spider-Man. We'll cross them over. And, you know, suddenly you're in the same universe with stuff that happened from, you know, the 1930s or 1940s that they've been publishing from timely comics. He's like, well, it made sense, but it was mostly marketing. Right. Yeah. And, but Stan being the kind of marketing genius he was, it wasn't just marketing. It was actually this crazy convoluted tale that, uh, just sucked you in and kept you reading. So yeah, fantastic it's thing. absolutely, absolutely something. So guys, we're going to take one more break. When we get back from this break, we're going to get to one of my favorite uh, segments of the show. And I like to find out what creators like to consume. So we're going to find out what Matt's been grooving on. We'll be right back. Oh, uh, Hey, it's me. Um, I'm interrupting this episode. And I hope you're enjoying it, and I bet you're anxious to hear the rest. But before we jump back, I need a favor. Do you know someone who might enjoy this episode? Can you shoot them a quick message or maybe even send them a link to it? Listeners sharing this podcast was the primary reason we almost doubled our audience last year. Also, would you like to see and hear these games in action? Go to the Third Floor Wars YouTube channel and Twitch stream. Our actual plays combine compelling role-playing, character-driven action, and system tutorials. We create great stories while lifting the hood and showcasing the game mechanics. Links to both are in the show notes. Okay, last thing, and I mean it. Have you rated this podcast on your pod platform yet? Maybe even written a short review? It is a simple way for you to be even more awesome than you already are. Okay, now I'm done. Let's jump back and listen to the rest of this episode. All right. So we've spent uh, well over an hour approaching to uh, talking about what you've made, Matt. And that's not all you do. Uh, like I have been consuming my Marvel book when I got it in the mail. Um, you do the same thing. You watch TV, you watch movies, you read books, you play video games. Is there something or a few things that have recently really just struck a chord with you? Something that's gotten into your head you haven't been able to get rid of? Man, there's all sorts of stuff, right? I, one of the things about doing this stuff for a living is you tend not to, when I'm done at the end of the day, I don't go play role-playing games. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I go play first-person shooters and stuff like that because yeah. I'm like, you know, I, I just needed something different. I have been scratching the creative itch all goddamn day, and if I keep doing it, I'm going to get raw. So, um, But, you know, I like consuming a lot of this stuff. Uh, man, the Barbie movie was freaking amazing. <laughs> I have not seen it. Talk to it's me about really it. It's really good. I mean, it's a it's a marketing tool too. Actually, I, I've done stuff for Mattel over the years, but Greta Gerwig and the crew there—they just really did a, as good of a job with that as I think you could. Right? No kidding. Uh, for a movie that's basically about kids' toys, right? Uh, a particular kids' toy that's you know gone up and down over the years and had a lot of uh, properly uh, proper criticisms leveled at it, right? They take all that, wrap it up into a ball, and have a great time with it. And it's just amazingly well done. 
What made um, it click? So when you walked away from that movie and you said, wow, that was really good. The creator knew goes back, right. And starts to pick it apart a little bit. Like what did they get right? They did so much right. For one, and you, you come up with a character or storyline that you actually care about, right? Interesting. Like, how do you get somebody to care about Barbie? Who's really, you know, most of the time to most of us doesn't have any personality at all, right? Yep. And and um, Margot Robbie just does a great job of the character, right? Uh, just fantastic. And Ken, oh man, Ken is just great in this movie too. Um, and the funny part is that you know Barbie basically goes on this adventure. And again, Barbie doesn't change all that much. Ken actually has the big moments that Interesting. change him in the movie instead uh has more of the dramatic arc but uh it was just there are moments where like there's a moment in the movie where one of the characters calls barbie a fascist (laughs) and barbie says but i don't control the rails or the means of production (laughs) and you're like wow you know i mean it's a joke right all the way through but just to to uh to see them be aware of what the criticisms are and then make a really funny joke out of it. Yeah. And, and then still address a lot of the issues as they go through. Uh, it, it made it so that if you liked Barbie before and you were maybe a closet Barbie fan, now you can just wear that proud. Uh, and if you didn't like Barbie before, well, I was not a big Barbie fan. You know, uh, most of the ones in my house, my, my little sisters would play with and Shea Bald at one point or another. But they had a weird Barbie character that was the representative of all the ones that had been Shea Bald. No kidding. Whatever. Like, Great. Because they understood what they were doing all the way through. I mean, you know, talking about making the Marvel game a Marvel game. They made this a Barbie movie. Oh, it wasn't cool. just a movie that happened to have a toy associated with it, right? It was really all about the brand. And that's just about the the character and the brand, but the way that we've experienced it and the way that people have experienced over the decades. So I was just totally impressed with that. Um, let's see what else. Uh, the Bear. I watched The Bear oh, uh, God. TV show. Freaking amazing. I didn't see the first season at all. Uh, and then the second season came out and people were like, oh my God, you got to watch this. <sighs> I'm like, I think I sat down and watched it all within about a week. <laughs> <laughs> so good. The it, bear it season is. two, episode six is just blazingly on fire episode, <laughs> which if you ever had any kind of dysfunctional family in your life, you will both be cringing and laughing and, and, you know, just going right along with it. And then the next episode after that, this is really quiet <laughs> character based episode that is just the exact opposite of, it, but it's just as well done. Right. And you're like, Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Those guys really knew what they were doing, right? I was blown away by that show. Um, I enjoyed the first season and appreciated the first season, got why it had gotten the buzz it had gotten. Um, But it wasn't really like going out of my way to recommend it to people. After watching the second season, I was blown away. Um, and I had to, I've got a very close friend of mine who is a professional writer. I'm like, have you seen the bear yet? And he goes, no. And I'm like, I need you to watch the bear because I need to talk to somebody about this and talk to somebody who understands what I want to talk about. And one of the things, Matt, that really struck me is, and I can say this and stand behind it. I don't know if I've ever come across a book, a movie or a TV show where I've cared this much about every single character. Right. I mean, the neat thing about it is the first season is really about the main character, Jeremy, right? The second season, they give everybody a spotlight. I mean, they do a good job of that in the first season, too. But the second season, like whole episodes devoted to each main character, right? Yep. And they do such a good job with it. So at the end, and I'm not going to spoil the last episode for anybody, but when it all falls apart, (gasps) it just breaks your heart. And at the same time, you understand exactly what's happening and why it's happening. And it's just really well done, right? Well, Such a good show. So good. And like, like characters um, and my friend who I talk about, Patrick is who I'm talking about. I can use his name like he's a real human. Um, Patrick captured it perfectly. um, And and this is just a small thing, but um, really, I think captures what's special about the show is her husband in the first season. He's a schlub. Right. He's just this throwaway character. He's kind of like doesn't fit in with everybody else. And by the end of season two, and Patrick said it perfectly, he goes, I felt like an asshole, <laughs> right? Right. Like, <laughs> like it turns out that this was an incredible human being right. and we were able, we were able to see that over this arc and it was, and it, and that wasn't the only time it happened. It happened with every single character in the show. Yeah. No, it's it, everybody there is lovable. 
right? Oh. Every one of them, right? That's a great thing about it. And you know, even there are no real villains. I mean, even the ones that you're are kind of off, you're like, you still care about them. So, yeah. man, it just did such a great job with it. Ah, uh, let's see what else. Um, video games. I haven't been playing too much lately, but I, I like devour the entire Yakuza series, right? I'm not familiar like from, with this. Uh, uh, Yakuza, Yakuza, however you want to pronounce it, but it's, uh, uh, done by a company uh, out of Japan. It's called Like a Dragon, right? That's the name mm. of the series in Japan. And there are these, uh, uh, basically, you're a young Yakuza lieutenant who is being, you know, uh, working his way up the chain. And Kiryu Kazuma is the name of your character. And there's been seven games in the series with him. And then they did an eighth one that came out last year that was went from real-time combat to turn-based combat. Uh, with a new character named Ichiban. And then they had a one that was set in feudal Japan recently. Uh, and, would, and all of them are great, right? The, the mechanics are fantastic. They're fun to play. Um, and the the character is just, uh, Kiryu is just so much fun to to, to be, essentially. In the Interesting. Um, and it's basically like crime story type stuff. It's all set in the mm-hmm. modern day. And the fun part is it actually ages as everything goes. So when you start the first game, you actually see them all the ages. They do a flashback to Yakuza Zero at one point. But, um, but you get to watch him and then his adopted daughter grow up. And, you know, it's, it's uh, you, again, you start caring about every one of them. And yeah. the new design they put in every one of the games as far as like, all right, now they have these little side games we thought were side games. Now they're actually really important to the story. And, and um and they, they do this part of Japan that is based upon a real section of Tokyo that is apparently so good that if you, uh, having played now eight versions of this game, I could probably walk through that part of the city and recognize bits of it, right? I mean, it's fictionalized, but the streets are all in the same patterns. Right. And wow. So really, it does feel alive in a lot of ways. And it's really goofy, over-the-top violence sometimes, too. So, um, uh, just really, really fun. Um so yeah, what, what made that click for you so well? Uh, you, you, obviously, uh, you can you hear it in the way you describe it how how much you enjoyed it um, through the whole series. Why? You know, my son Marty does this to me. He's got these things. He's like, "Dad, I love this," and yeah, you got to play this. And I'm like, "Ah, oh, yeah, whatever, kid. I'll get to it eventually." <laughs> um, and he basically sat me down and uh, watched me play the first part of Yakuza Zero. He says, "You got to start from the beginning, and go all the way through," and I. Uh, I think I bounced off at the first time. Like, ah, it's, it's okay. And uh, then I sat down one day and I just started playing. I just kept playing and playing and playing. And I played through. They were all part of the Xbox Game Pass too, right? So I'm like, oh, I just go on to the next one. Don't even have to think about spending money. It's right yep. there. I already, yep. I already have it. Um, and it was like potato chips. I just couldn't stop, right? <laughs> uh, but you start caring about the characters and the, and the crazy, goofy bits. There's this one villain that uh, I think Mark Hamill did one of the voices for oh. at one point. He kind of comes across like the Joker. Marty's like, if you just think about Kiryu as Batman <laughs> and this guy is the Joker and you're basically just beating the crap out of each other in, in modern day Tokyo in the, in the Japanese underworld, it, it, it's, it sparks off. It was fantastic, right? Um and you know, I, we played it with the subtitles on listening to the Japanese voice actors. And oh, wow. Really well done. So, uh, so I got a kick out of that. And, you know, a neat thing about that is I, I do a lot of video game work nowadays. So I get to take some of those things and uh, deploy them in my work. I actually, I worked on a game called Hard West 2 that came out last year that they I got hired on for because the guys who were the developers grew up playing Deadlands and they loved it. So Isn't that like, so? Oh, we'll hire Matt in. He can help us out with this. Um, okay. <laughs> Uh, but part of it was it was this Polish company and they didn't know uh, the, the, when it came to actually doing the voice acting, they didn't feel comfortable enough doing the direction on their on their own. So they actually had me direct the voice acting. Too. No kidding. And that was fun. And we got to work with some amazing people. Kevin. Had you Conway, done that before? I, I'd done it a couple of times. Right. Uh, but uh, step in and like, I got Kevin Conroy. I'm directing here. Holy Christ. The voice of Batman is doing this old undead gunslinger. comes in and, and Kevin takes direction so easily. It was like, I would say, well, how about a little bit more like that? He'd go, bro, and he just nailed it. He was so good. So good. Uh, so much fun to work with. He passed, you know, last year, I guess. Really. Yeah. I'm not sure I forget. It's been a while now, but 
what a great, talented, incredible human being, right? Really, and, and you just said it perfectly. Not only was he one of the best ever that's d- that does that work, uh, um, become a, become our Batman. Uh, for a lot of us, he is our Batman, right? But to then find out repeatedly just what an incredible human being he was, it's that's pretty cool. No, uh, he's triumphant, man, all the way through. Uh, it was but for books. I, I mostly read my friends. I read like, you know, Chuck Wendig, Wes Chu, uh, all these different guys I've known that we all kind of got in the game, into the publishing uh, yeah. at the same time. Um, one, st- one thing, John Scalzi, uh, um, that kind of stuff. One series I really, really liked, and I can't get the voice out of my head, is as uh, Martha Wells. And I don't know Martha, so that's, un- that, you know, it's good. But uh, she does this series called Murderbot. Uh, which is a science fiction series about a uh, a intelligence security droid that manages to crack its own programming, break itself free, and it basically comes across as like this autistic character, right? Now, uh, you know, it, it's really well done. It's wow. amazingly well done, and the voice that she's developed for this character is just so so goddamn endearing <laughs> for for a creature called Murderbot. You're yeah. rooting for Murderbot. Murderbot's like, well, I was listening to them, but I was actually on episode 365 of this soap opera I've been following in the background. <laughs> You're like, it's just so damn fun. Oh, that's all cool. The way so, yeah, every time a Murderbot story comes out, I, I leap all over. It's just too much fun. That's awesome. Well, Matt, there is a lot of really cool things to do on a Wednesday night that doesn't involve spending an hour or so with me. So I, I really appreciate you making the time. Oh, happy to do it. It's good to talk to you. All right. Cheers. And hey, for those of you listening. You made it all the way to the end. Thank you for doing that, too. Take care, all. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Subscribe to Tabletop Talk and share it with your friends. Check out our content on YouTube and Twitch. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook and stay updated on everything coming from Third Floor. All the links are in the show notes. Take care, Floorheads. Matt, that was like, that's the podcast. That was absolutely fantastic, my friend. Thank you so much. Nice and easy. Nothing to it. Yeah, that was perfect. Um, So what I'm thinking here, just because I think it ties kind of both both sides that parallels with you. I want to talk first about the books, where the books came from and then how they became a game. Does that sound okay to you? Sure. Awesome. I know all those answers. (laughs) <laughs> Good. <laughs> I got the right guy. <laughs> Pretty sure. Pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll bring us back. <laughs> uh, For us to talk about, we're going to talk about Marvel Multiverse and the role playing game. We'll be right back. I don't know why I said and the role playing game. I'm going to edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, actually, uh, since we have a break, can I just pull up my water glass? Of course, quick? please, 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 please go. Then you're getting unrestricted information from people. It's definitely the best way to go. Hi. I'm still doing a podcast here. That's the reason the door shut. <laughs> yeah, I didn't I didn't put the sign the other way. I thought I didn't have that to you. Could you shut the door, please? Hey, thank you. That's Kenny. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> he opened the door. I'm like, is he gonna say something? Is he gonna not figure out talking to somebody? He did. Okay. Anyhow, um, what the hell are we talking? <laughs> we're talking about the plan, the plan to to right from oh, the yeah, very the beginning, the play test version. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I've been looking forward to that segment so much, Matt, and it <laughs> was beyond even what I expected. That That's um, cool. that was awesome, man. That was awesome. So this is a segment, Matt, that has just organically started appearing in the show um, and has become a listener favorite, which is you talking about what you love. Um, Things recently that you have read, you've watched, you've played that have gotten its hooks into you the same way you hope the stuff you make gets their hooks in someone else. Um, Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, cool. I'll bring us back.
Oh, hey, are you still here? Wow. Um, well, the episode is over, but if you're bored, why not go to patreon.com and support the show for as little as a dollar a month? Yeah, you can just scroll down. Scroll down and, yeah, get the link. It's Patreon that makes this and all of our other content possible. Don't you want to join the other floorheads on the Patreon Discord? Anyway, thanks for sticking around. Take care. Bye.